Morning, we'll now resume county budget hearings. This is the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors special meeting. It is Thursday, June 23rd, 2022. Clerk, could you please call the roll? Supervisor Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. And Koenig? Here. Thank you, Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. Theo Palacios, do we have any additions, revisions, or deletions for the agenda today? Uh, we have nothing. All right, thank you. Then we'll proceed with item 42, the budget manager's overview for public safety and justice. Budget manager Pimentel will provide us a short presentation. Good morning, Chair Koenig, and thank you for joining us into uh, day three of our budget hearings. Uh, today, we'll, we'll be stepping into the land of public safety and justice, and then continuing to our concluding actions on Tuesday for our public, or to conclude our public hearings. Um, I'm gonna provide you an overview of the departments that are both providing you presentations today, as well as those that are on consent. And those are all in our public safety and justice departments. Um, we'll start with our public defender's office and then conclude with the sheriff coroner. So included within this category are, are departments that are on consent and, and many of these are funding where we're a member of or we provide funding for, um, as well as uh, county fire who, who provides or, count, or fire services through Cal Fire contracts. Uh, the departments and budgets that are on consent are the 911 Communication Center, our animal contribution, our animal control services, our contribution to the Superior Court, our county fire protection and our grand jury. The departments that will be presenting to you their budget for consideration today include the public defender's office, probation, district attorney, and our sheriff coroner. I recommend that you hold any questions for those four departments for their presentations. In total, this category is $183.6 million of all funds for the county. Uh, the largest allocation goes to our sheriff coroner at 93.9 million or 51.1% of this category. Um, when we, this particular category, all week I've been talking in terms of all funds versus general fund. This is one of those categories that most of the funding is general fund funding. So of the 183.6 million, 169.6 is general fund funding. So the largest majority of our general fund lives here as far as a proportion of, of the total budget. Um, probation, the district attorney and the public defender's office are the next three largest after the sheriff. The remaining costs are attributed to their contracts and our contributions that include again, the provision of fire protection by Cal Fire, our contributions to the Superior Courts, 911 Communication Center, Animal Services Center, and our support of the grand jury. In terms of how much the general fund contributes directly to support these departments, um, again, in terms of the funding that they're able to provide, these are the departments that are limited in their capacity to generate their own internal funding. Now, that being said, the um, probation and sheriff coroner do a wonderful job of getting a lot of federal and state funding. In total, they, they bring in $54 million. Uh, this category brings in $54 million, just largely for, from sheriff, largely from probation to help fund um, using federal and state dollars to help fund this category. Um, the, you might recall that across all general fund contributions, we contribute the greatest amount to this category, um, $103.9 million. The next category, health and human, gets $39 million. So by comparison, we're prioritizing devoting most of our general fund uh, discretionary resources to supporting these departments. Um, the sheriff coroner, as this pie chart shows, receives the largest allocation at 60.4 million or 59% of, of these contributions with the district attorney, public defender and probation, each receiving between 9.3 million and 15.2 million of general fund support. As far as what has changed in the general fund support from last year, the greatest amount has, has gone to increase the funding and support of our sheriff coroner at 3.9 million. They received a 6.8% increase. A district attorney also received 1.5 million and probation received uh, 0.7 million in additional funding support. A lot of it is attributed to just normal costs. 
Um, there are some position increases, but they're very modest for the 22-23 budget. So a lot of what's been driving these particular costs are normal cost of services, increasing costs, and the big word inflation that we've been talking about that's starting this to show itself in a lot of categories. As far as positions, um, we've talked a lot about our success at bringing the public defender's office to an in-house county service begin fully staffed beginning next month. Um, that is where the biggest position increase has gone into the 22-23 budget. There's been 40 positions that are added to this budget to, to finish the transition of that department from a contract to a, a funded county program. Um, while the remaining of the departments have received just a few positions, the sheriff at two additional positions, probation at a half, and the district attorney at three. What's notable is, is that the sheriff coroner and the probation each added eight positions after the adoption of last year's budget. So in this current budget year, they already have added eight positions that have increased their force. Um, while we would all like to see those numbers be greater, um, that is important to reflect that it's not just the two or the half. Um, they've already got eight positions that they were able to help bring on board this year um, as a mid-year adjustment for next year's support. That concludes my overview. Um, well, next your next actions are to consider the consent agenda, go to public comments, uh, continue the budget hearings with the four departments that will be presenting to you today, and then consider the approval of those four departments and continue the budget hearings to June 28th. Um, I'm happy to discuss any questions or comments you might have on the consent agenda item. And then, and then I know the departments will welcome your comments or feedback during their presentations. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Budget Manager Pimentel. Are there any questions or comments from members of the board? You know, maybe I'll make Supervisor a general, McPherson. Yes. The general comment, it really focuses on the Sheriff's Department and uh, other police agencies throughout the county. But I think it, uh, it needs to be mentioned right, right from the start about to thank our sheriff uh, in particular for embracing the 21st century uh, policing protocols several years ago and aligning all five of our local law enfor for, uh, enforcement agencies to do the same. But our law enforcement and criminal justice leaders didn't stop with that. And with the national conversation about police policies and procedures becoming increasingly important, our criminal justice council in the county conducted what is, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> what is believed to be the first regional comparative review in the country, in the United States, regarding how our law enforcement and criminal justice agencies align and are most effective. As a result, uh, as a result of the, that review, multiple agencies in our community updated their policies, use of force, technology, oversight, and privacy with the aid of uh, to continually work together to improve improve the effectiveness of local law enforcement partnering with uh, the criminal within the criminal justice system. In May, the National Association of Counties honored the effort with an award, which was very well deserved, the first in the United States. I want to thank Supervisor Friend, especially our county's representative on the National Association of Counties for his continual strong support with NACO and for our law enforcement and criminal justice agencies and officers. And congratulations to all the agencies for your hard work in participating in the multi-year review for the outstanding outcomes that are well, well, uh, that are well recognized nationally. Um, this is, I know, maybe a little out of line before we're gonna get down to the specific uh, agencies, but this is really, really special. And uh, I just wanna congratulate the sheriff and all the law enforcement agencies in Santa Cruz County for literally getting their act together to better serve the people of Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Caput. Yeah, uh, thanks Mark uh, for your report and everything. Uh, this is more of a general question because you're, overlooking the whole uh, uh, budget, I guess. Uh, and uh, philosophically uh, with the market, the way it's going uh, and the economy uh, are the investments that we're making uh, with the county where we put our money and uh, are they doing, uh, are they going down or are they sort of leveling off or do you have any idea? Yeah, the portfolio that we invest in is, is very conservative. So there, we, our portfolio will always go up. 
It's just how fast will it grow? Is it growing by a half a percent or a percent? We don't we don't invest aggressively. We invest from the three tier priority of safety, liquidity, and yield. So we, we prioritize the safety of our funds. We prioritize uh, cash flow, making sure it's available. And the interest rate earnings on our investment is the last priority. So it's a very low priority for us. So to answer your question, are we are not being impacted by any uh, economic investments that are happening or stock market declines. That's not impacting us as an entity. Uh, it is indirectly impacting us in the terms of like CalPERS. They're heavily invested in the stock market. So as, as their returns de decline and they're starting to see losses in their fund, they will increase contributions that all California agencies pay into pensions. Yeah. So it's indirectly going to impact us, but we as a county, we conserve, we invest very conservatively. So we're not impacted by what's happening in the stock market, if that's your question. And, and most of our investments are what very conservative and uh, are yeah, agency notes, bonds, right? Yeah, bonds are, are every, every place we're putting our funding, and that's that's guaranteed income at very low rates. I know because it, it doesn't look good right now as far as uh, uh, stocks and all that. So anyway, that's good to know. Uh, thanks, Mark, and. Take care. And I, and I give the compliments to uh, our other controllers who manages our portfolio, Edith Triscoll and her team. They do a, a really nice job of, of managing that. Yeah. I, I think uh, Supervisor McPherson, uh, you you overlook the uh, Treasury and stuff like that, right? So, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm on the Treasury Oversight Committee now. Yeah. It is. Very prudent in fiscal, uh, conservative investments, as you said. All right, any further comments or questions? Then we'll proceed with action on the consent agenda and we'll begin with public comment on the consent agenda. Again, this is uh, to approve the budgets for the 911 Communication Center, Animal Control Services, contribution to the Superior Court, County Fire Protection and Grand Jury. So please address your comments to uh, one or more of those departments. Good morning, my name is James Ewan Whitman. <clears throat> Although I wanted to address, I think it's the consent agenda item number 51 or 52 that had to do with fire and stuff. Uh, I'd rather kind of speak on some of the things that were mentioned today. Um, first, I actually want to say that um, I'm not jealous of the bicycle that you use to go to work, Manu Kooning, but you have a you have good taste. Um, Believe it or not, in the past three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I spent a significantly more amount of time in the court system than I did here. Significantly more amount of time. Um, I experienced the law enforcement mostly being extremely courteous, if not funny. There was something that happened yesterday that really wasn't as courteous, and it really wasn't funny. Um, you know, I have been in on the third floor and the fourth floor of this building literally hundreds of times to get permits and get information. And that has assisted me with a livelihood where I have tens of thousands of hours working in this county and probably at least 250 signed inspections. So I'm only standing here because I'm okay with being the responsible party to be responsible for what I've said. 42 seconds. So... I don't know. I have some stuff that's pretty interesting. This is about the Fabian Society. We have a supervisor that was trained at the London Fabian School. This is a delightful piece of information. It is titled Guide to Overthrowing Tyrants and Putting a Stop to Government Abuse. It really focuses with, focuses with the U.S. Constitution. I have 17 seconds. I may make comments about you guys just being scripted actors. But what I'm holding in my hand is the Santa Cruz County Local Agenda 21, a sustainable community action plan on our agenda for the future. Final draft for consideration by Santa Cruz County municipalities Thank you, Mr. and Whitman. the Board of Supervisors. Thank There's you. a lot of information in here. Thank you, you guys. Anyone else wishing to comment on our consent agenda items? Seeing none, all, uh, is there anyone on Zoom that wishes to comment? Yes, Chair, we do have one speaker. Charlie Eady, your microphone is now available. Okay, hi. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, Charlie Eady, Eady Consultants. I work with the uh, residents at Pajaro Dunes. 
um, commenting on the uh, CSA 4 budget. And uh, we have worked closely with the uh, Cal Fire and county officials as we do every year on getting to this budget and uh, approving it with uh, internally with the uh, organizations at Pajaro Dunes. One thing that was noted in your uh, agenda item was the LAFCO uh, reorganization report. And um, I just wanted to say that uh, Pajaro Dunes is closely watching this. There's a lot of concern among the residents there about anything that might potentially reduce their fire services. And uh, there's a lot of unknowns financially and service-wise related to the uh, upcoming LAFCO process. And I just wanted to uh, let you know that uh, Pajaro Dunes is it wants to participate in this and has a lot of concerns that we hope will be addressed. We have met with a uh, supervisor friend and he's been very uh, helpful and we will probably be, probably be talking with other supervisors as well as this uh, process moves forward. We do support the current budget and uh, we do want to uh, continue to collaborate with the county and uh, really want to understand the LAFCO uh, proposal and all the information that comes out of that process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eady. We have no further speakers, Chair. We have one more speaker here in the chambers. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I am a resident of uh, rural Aptos and a member of CSA 48. I, um, I'm concerned about the funding for county fire because I feel that the uh, 2020 special benefit assessment that was levied upon the um, CSA 48 property owners was not um, properly done. I see in the newspaper, there is a public hearing next Tuesday for uh, the assessments regarding this and the other fixed uh, fire flow rate charges, but there is nothing on the county fire website about this. There's been no public notice regarding this public hearing next Tuesday. Under Gov California government code 5078.2, it is not legal to levy special benefit assessments uh, for fire suppression on areas on properties within the state responsibility area. And that is exactly what the county did with a special benefit assessment that was passed in 2020. This is under litigation, but I wanna make you aware that um, I have great concerns as one who is paying those taxes that the county fire chief at the time, Ian Larkin, as soon as this, this money was beginning to come in, he ordered type one engines to serve the rural areas of Santa Cruz County for fire suppression. Type one engines are very large, they're very heavy, and are not suited for the narrow roads and bridges of Santa Cruz County rural area. There, there was a real need for type three engines, but that's not how the money was spent. I also have Thank concerns you, about whether Cal It's Tuesday's meeting. One. Mr. Chair, uh, um, I can't. I'm sorry. Right. Supervisor Caput, if you if you could, I think we'll 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 proceed. If you could, yeah. Oh, thank you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you all. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I, I'd like to make a comment on uh, the county fire item number tw uh, fifty-one. Uh, I want to thank and both congratulate County Fire for its successes this past year. Um, a special note is the zone, zone Haven evacuation system, which was essential to the successful evacuation of thousands of residents in the CZU fire, as well as the storm-related debris flow evacuations thereafter. 
Um, County Fire has struggled uh, for years with volunteer recruitment, but I'm pleased to see that 13 new volunteer firefighters and EMRs um, graduated from the academy this year. I'm sure that'll be a help. I'll be sure it added protection for the people of Santa Cruz County. Uh, we have quite a bit of work to do over the next two years to revise our county master fire plan and evaluate the best use of our limited resources, but it's really encouraging to see that we have some new uh, 13 new volunteer firefighters and I thank uh, County Fire for the services it provides. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Any other comments or uh, questions on the consent agenda? So move the consent agenda. Second. Motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor McPherson to approve the consent agenda. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk roll call vote please. Supervisor Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. Consent agenda passes unanimously. Thank you. The uh, budget for those departments being approved will proceed with item 44 on our regular agenda to consider approval of the 22-23 proposed budget for the public defender, including any supplemental materials and take related actions as outlined in the reference budget documents as recommended by the county administrative officer. And for presentation on this, we have our public defender, Heather Rogers. Uh, Ms. Rogers, I believe your microphone just to be turned on. Button. Thank you. Are we in business? Yeah. Wonderful. Good morning again. It's very nice to see you. Our newest Supreme Court Justice, Katanji Jackson Brown, the first Black woman on the Supreme Court and the first former public defender, had this to say about her service as a public defender. I care deeply about our Constitution and the rights that make us free. Defense lawyers perform a service and our system is exemplary throughout the world precisely because we ensure that people who are accused of crimes are treated fairly. Strong public defense makes our system stronger. Strong public defense ensures procedural integrity and just outcomes. Strong public defense strengthens our community and it makes us safer. The Santa Cruz County Office of the Public Defender is committed to strong public defense. I wanna take this opportunity to introduce and thank Assistant CAO Nicole Coburn, Principal Administrative Analyst Sven Stafford, and Public Defender Administrative Services Manager Adam Spickler, who are co-presenting with me today. They've collaborated in the many hours of thought and work that went into this budget, but also that went into building this new agency. We'll now switch over to our county's new budget website to give you an overview of our department's proposed budget, which is publicly available at santacruzcounty.us backslash vision Santa Cruz backslash budget. The mission, vision, and values of the Office of the Public Defender drive our budget proposal. It is our mission to courageously defend the accused, to demand equal justice for all, to empower our clients with inspired advocacy in the courtroom and community. We're on a mission to elevate public defense, one client at a time. On July 1st, 2022, we opened the doors on our county's first ever Office of the Public Defender. Our office will provide public defense services mandated by the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution and necessary for ensuring a criminal justice system that is equitable, effective, and fair. We'll represent the thousands of people a year who are accused of crimes in Santa Cruz County and cannot afford to hire their own attorney. In addition to supporting the new Office of the Public Defender, the county will continue to provide conflict counsel for cases where our office cannot represent the accused, for example, because two people are charged in the same case. 
The county administrative office will administer two levels of conflicts with the law firm of Page and Dudley handling most of the conflicts and a conflict panel of skilled local defense attorneys managed by county council handling the rest. Together, the three public defense providers in our county share a total budget of $14,999,279, with $2,975,000 of that total budget going to the conflict contracts. The principles I'll talk about today apply to public defense in general, but my focus will be on our new agency and the approximately $12 million we'll need to ensure that people in Santa Cruz County who are accused of crimes are treated fairly. The county's new budget website doesn't yet reflect our agency's operational plan because we're brand new. We open on July 1st. We'll propose an operational plan to this board in the fall. In the meantime, I'll preview some of our objectives later in the presentation, including early representation, community-based whole person defense, improved technology and training, increased services in South County, a focus on equity and a case management system that will help us track outcomes. Our new agency costs start where our contracted public defense services end on June 30th, 2022. The private law firm's costs had increased on average roughly 4% per year since at least 2017. In fiscal year 21-22, the contracted law firm's costs totaled over $9.4 million. The cost required for our new agency to bring over the current private law firm staff and conduct simply a status quo operation is estimated at about $10 million. That's a 6% increase over fiscal year 21-22. The increase accounts for public defense staff having pay parity for the first time with the DA's office and implementing a structure that is transparent and accountable to the citizens of Santa Cruz County. Our proposed first year budget includes an additional investment to begin addressing recommendations for improvement. It includes staffing linked to national caseload standards and additional technology training and supervision to make sure that our clients receive effective representation. Our services and supplies budget funds modern technology, including a robust case management system, laptop, laptops for on-site and remote work that integrate with courtroom technology, and innovative tools for collecting and tracking data to provide our clients with access to social support services. These costs are offset by new state funding of $350,000 and $300,000 in savings from renegotiation and right sizing of the conflict contracts. We also expect our new service model to result in systemic savings as we work with our partners to address clients' unmet social needs and create collaborative models for providing upstream services to avoid downstream costs. In the next part of my presentation, I'll provide an overview of what we'll do with this budget as we work together to elevate public defense. <laughs> my goal is the new county public defender is to bring model practices to Santa Cruz County as we learn from public defenders around the country what is working in communities like ours. We'll provide community-based whole person defense with a small executive division to guide policy, a lean administrative division for legal services, operational and IT support, a robust legal division, investigations division, and holistic defense division to provide direct client services, and a training equity and de development division to support our defense teams. In addition to the aggressive courtroom advocacy that we've been bringing to this community for over 47 years, we'll have dedicated defense teams in each courtroom and a holistic defense division that includes social workers and client advocates. As whole person defenders, our defense teams will include advocates from different disciplines, including defense lawyers, investigators, holistic defense advocates, attorneys with an expertise in immigration, record clearance, and legal writing, administrative professionals, and outside experts. 
Teams will be assigned to a single courtroom like Department 3 over in the courthouse or a single unit like juvenile justice and specialty courts. Our teams will work together to help clients lift themselves up and out of the system. We will work toward meeting or exceeding national caseload standards for public defense, which tell us the maximum number of cases of a certain type each attorney should handle in a year and set staffing guidelines for investigators, paralegals, social service caseworkers, and supervisors. In 2020, the county commissioned the nonprofit Sixth Amendment Center to evaluate our public defense system. The center commended our defenders for their dedication, their talent, and their skill. But the center also pointed out ways that we must move toward meeting national guidelines and standards. The center recommended the county appoint a public defender. And in the nine months since being appointed, I've worked with the county's transition team to carefully analyze our system, develop a plan for this new agency, and create this proposed budget. Our recommendations for public defense position us to be a leader at a time when our state is focused on correcting problems that have burdened other county public defender offices. Problems that have led to lawsuits related to excessive caseloads, insufficient training and ineffective representation. I've met with stakeholders, analyzed our caseloads in view of national guidelines, examined our justice system's revenue and expenditures, reviewed the current caseloads of our felony attorneys, observed court, and applied my own nearly two decades of experience as a public defender and nearly a decade as a defender in this county to project the budget that we'll need to stand up an agency that provides exceptional service to our clients and truly reflects the values of this community. If we apply the national standards to our defense teams, there is a discrepancy between what we've asked for and the national standards. To get a sense of where we've been and where we'd like to go, we've represented the private firm staffing in light blue to provide a baseline. The green column represents the staffing suggested by national guidelines. Our proposed staffing is in deep blue. Our proposed staffing is a compromise reached after looking carefully at current staffing across the system. We thought about how drastically increasing our staff during a transition would shift time and energy from client services to training and orientation. And we have determined that the wisest course is to build capacity gradually using workload data tied to Santa Cruz County that we'll collect in upcoming years. In the end, closing the gap between national caseload standards and our proposed staffing will require reduced caseloads or increased personnel. Reducing caseloads requires us to come together as a community and figure out how to use the other tools in our toolkit, like housing, mental health services, social services, and restorative justice to address the root causes of system involvement and bring down our prosecution rate. The only other way to close the gap is to increase public defense staffing so that we can keep up with new prosecutions. I think we can all agree that less crime and fewer prosecutions is better for this community. To that end, we're working closely with the district attorney's office and our other community, county, and court partners to reach upstream, offer preventative services earlier in the process, and together identify cases that are appropriate for alternative resolutions. The budget we've proposed achieves five objectives to fulfill our mission, realize our vision, and reflect our values. With this budget, we'll move toward meeting national standards for public defense caseloads. We'll staff defense teams to provide community-based whole person defense using model practices. We'll embed equity in our culture, procedure, and practices. We'll invest in IT, training, and supervision to enhance advocacy and outcomes, and we'll partner with our community. Our proposed budget funds dedicated defense teams, training and technology, holistic defense services, early representation, vertical representation, community outreach programs, and partnerships to improve services and secure grants. In the new agency, we'll pair aggressive courtroom advocacy with holistic defense to provide community-based whole person defense. 
This is defense that focuses on the client behind the case. Holistic defense is a model that provides seamless access to services that meet each client's legal and social needs, dynamic interdisciplinary communication, advocates with an interdisciplinary skill set, and a robust understanding of and connection to the community served. The truth is our clients need more than just traditional criminal defense. They need wraparound services to address root causes, to ensure the best legal and social outcomes, and to return to their communities. Whenever possible, we'll represent our clients as early as possible. We're developing a pilot program at the jail that will allow us to represent incarcerated clients after arrest and before first court date. We're working to create a pilot program in South County that gives youthful offenders ages 18 to 25 charged with misdemeanors the option of meeting with an attorney right after their arrest and before their first court appearance. By getting to clients earlier, we can reduce incarceration times, speed up the delivery of supportive services, explore options for diverting a case before it's even filed and mitigate the consequences of system involvement. Our defense teams will provide vertical representation, which means our clients will have the same defense team from their first court appearance, ideally through reentry. We'll aim to provide the same excellent, consistent, personalized service that paying clients get at the best law firms. <laughs> And we'll partner with our community. We'll provide outreach to our neighbors who are struggling with issues related to justice system involvement. We'll have bi-monthly clean slate workshops in North and South County to help with record clearance. Job resource fairs, highlighting employers willing to work with our reentry clients and workshops for families supporting system impacted youth. We're developing partnerships with organizations aligned with our mission and pursuing alternative funding streams. This includes a contract with Partners for Justice to fund three client advocates to help us learn how to provide effective holistic defense. A grant award from the Board of State and Community Corrections, which provides funding to work on post-conviction relief. And relationships with local nonprofits that provide complementary services like immigration advocacy, housing resources, and job training. <clears throat> on behalf of our public defender team, including the defenders who will join us on July 1st, thank you for this opportunity to continue to serve our community. It's our honor. As public defenders, we are public servants. And as public servants, we're committed to ensuring that Santa Cruz County is a beacon of courageous, compassionate, client-focused public defense. This budget proposal gives us what we need to fulfill our constitutional and our statutory mandates. The right to a public defender is a fundamental right guaranteed by the Sixth Amendment to the United States Constitution. As public defenders, we don't choose who gets arrested. We don't choose who gets charged, who goes to prison, or who goes home. We don't choose which cases to file or how many. We choose the calling to defend. And this budget will give us what we need to answer that calling with strong public defense. As the public defender of Santa Cruz County, I respectfully request that this board approve our fiscal year 2022-2023 proposed budget and supplemental materials included in the continuing agreements list as recommended by the county administrative officer. Thank you so much for your time and your support of us during this transition. We're truly grateful. Thank you, Public Defender Rogers. Are there questions or comments from members of the board? Yeah. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'd, um, congratulations <clears throat> to our first public, public, public defender, Heather Rogers, and your team for developing the first budget and the new department and for launching operations on July 1st. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some um, upcoming surprises as we go along. Uh, being the first is uh, great, but it's also real challenging. Uh, this has been a huge undertaking for this county, and we must once again thank Nicole Coburn and Sven Stafford uh, from the CAO's office, as well as our justice partners um, and longtime contracted public defenders that served Santa Cruz so, so well for over 40 years for making this initiative a reality. Um, 
I'm truly excited about it. I look forward to hearing uh, later updates this year on to the progress as uh, you go along. Uh, There's going to be some tremendous challenges, but we really feel confident that we have selected the best person for this position, Ms. Rogers, and uh, we wish you well and uh, for defending those who can't defend themselves in court. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Caput. Okay, uh, you're doing a great job. Uh, I, I, uh, I I don't think I've seen the term uh, too Cap often. Supervisor Caput, would you just pull the microphone a little closer to your mouth, please? Holistic uh, approach to uh, uh, legal uh, uh, terms. When you say holistic, it's kind of involving the the client or whatever. Usually I think of that as a medical term, but anyway, it's kind of yeah. uh, it's kind of nice to see. Thank you. We're really excited about it. I think by really focusing on the whole person, we're going to have much better outcomes. You bet. And then the staffing right now is 40. Is that correct? But uh, uh, in the budget, it looks like 56 is good. That's uh uh, how many attorneys would that be and how many uh, analysts would that be or investigators? Sure. So we're looking at 31 attorneys, eight investigators, um, 10 administrative professional staff, and three social workers. Okay. And then we also will have our three advocates funded through the Partners for Justice contract that you approved earlier this year which I think will, will be tremendous for helping us really understand how to use this model to achieve the best outcomes. Yeah. And I, I think what, uh, what strikes me about the public defender, uh, when you get older, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we haven't, I haven't needed, or people that I know haven't needed the public defender's office. But what I think about is it's the safety net that uh, I have five kids. I don't know how they're going to turn out, all of them, or my grandkids, or whatever. And it's it's good to know that there's a public defender's office that will be there if they ever need it, and hopefully they won't. But uh, uh, and here's a history question. I'm sorry, I apologize. But uh, how long? A uh, hundred years ago, did they have public defenders or? Uh, where someone can't, couldn't afford uh, a lawyer. Uh, how did they handle that? Do you have any idea? I don't think there were. Uh, you know, I think the Supreme Court provided in Gideon versus Wainwright the right to a public defender. And it's, you know, somewhat of a, a modern thing. And it's it's so critical, I think, to really upholding the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution. Right. And we're um, we're just getting better at it every year as we, you know, share ideas around the country and try to understand how to use our resources to get the best outcomes. Yeah, you can imagine how frightening it would be if you didn't have an at attorney defending you and having to go into court, and uh, <laughs> it would be uh, it would be terrible. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. There comments or questions from board members. Can I ask, um, uh, we're excited to have you, Ms. Rogers, and thank you for your hard work standing up this office. Can you talk a little bit about um, our approaches to chronic uh, reoffenders, both low level and more serious, and then also how care court could uh, impact your operations in the next year? Sure, that's such a good question. Um, you know, I think the first thing that we need to think about when we think about, you know, chronic offenders is root causes. You know, what's keeping people in this kind of revolving door of recidivism? And what can we do better working, you know, holistically with our partners in the court, the community and the county to address root causes so that we can help people lift themselves up and out of the system. Um, I've been doing this for a long time and it's heartbreaking to see the same clients year after year. You get a good result and then you know six months later they're there again with the same problem. And so what we're hoping to do is to just be more real about the fact that the best, most aggressive courtroom defense in the world 
only is going to get you to that um, that next arrest if we don't really think about how you ended up here in the first place. So I'm hoping that by having a holistic defense division with social workers and client advocates, and by really uh, training our staff and, and myself, all of us together on how holistic advocacy is working in other communities like ours, that we will see those rates go down. I think it's also critical to just, you know, really give a shout out and props to the district attorney's office for their restorative justice programming and for their really deep commitment to working together to solve these problems. This is not a district attorney's office that is, you know, interested in getting a higher prosecution rate. They're interested in making our community whole. And I think that together with all of the leadership that we have in this county right now, we're going to see some really important changes. Care court is really interesting. And, you know, we're trying to wrap our heads around how we can really make it work for this community, while at the same time balancing some of the civil liberty issues that are at play there. And, you know, again, we have working groups and teams that are looking at this together so that we can think about how we can take this model if it's implemented and make sure that it fits our community. Because we have a unique situation here in Santa Cruz County, not just by virtue of the people that we serve, but also because of the leaders in this county and how well we are working together um, to try to use our resources to reach common goals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Just a, a couple questions. The first is, I mean, I know you've got this uh, gigantic job of opening a brand new office here on July 1st. How is it going getting all the supplies that you need? I mean, computers, floors, uh, everything to, to get all your staff working effectively. And I know also you've got a flood of, of cases to deal with here. So how's it going? It's going really well. Um, it was a little bit of a cliffhanger there for a minute with, you know, worldwide glue shortage and COVID and um, a lot of curveballs thrown our way. But, you know, again, the county team has been tremendous. Um, GSD and the CAO's office and really everybody, um, personnel, everyone's come together. It's, it's a barn raising over there right now at May Avenue with floors going in and paint going on the walls. They're setting up furniture today. We only have a few days until we open and we're kind of in that moving phase where you look at all the boxes and you think, oh my goodness, what have we done? But um, I just know that on July 1st, we're gonna walk into a, you know, a fresh, beautiful space with a mission and vision that builds on what we've been doing here for so long. And it's, it's gonna feel great. I hope that you'll come visit us. Look forward to visiting you, and I'm glad to hear you're getting the support you need. Yeah, thank you. Um, you also mentioned that the uh, sort of a status quo budget, continuing from the contract with the private firm, would have been about ten million dollars, um, and of course your budget is about fifteen million dollars, so about a fifty percent increase. Um, would you say most of that is going to those improved? somewhat improved case ratios. I mean, as you said, we're not at the national average or, or recommended average yet. But um, you know, and of course we didn't have case workers. Uh, before and we we will have some now. So it, would you say is that where the increase is going to or something else? Yes. Yeah, so our proposed budget is about twelve million dollars, and the firm's contract was nine point four million. Um, so I want to make sure that we're thinking about um, there's two different things going on. We have the total public defense budget, and then the public defenders budget. And so the total public defense budget is administered um, by the CAO's office. We also have county council managing the conflicts contract and then our budget for our piece of it, and we will handle most of the defense in the county is that $12 million number. Um, so if you look at the 2021-2022 cost of the private firm, it was 9.4 million. And the cost required for our new agency to bring over the current private law firm staff and just do a status quo operation would have been about 10 million. So that's about a 6% increase over last year for what we're looking at just to do status quo. What we did in the last nine months is think really strategically and carefully about some of the recommendations that we received from the Sixth Amendment Center, from the grand jury, from you know other folks who chimed in and, and let us know how we could do better and where we were doing well. And we've invested in those areas that we think will really make sure that we are positioned as a leader in the state. 
rather than playing catch up or falling behind. And I also really truly believe, and I can't wait until we can bring you some data with this amazing new case management system that starts on July 1st as well. But I really think the, the systemic savings that we're going to see by reaching upstream and working collaboratively are gonna result in savings across the system. Um, and that's just something that we're gonna have to watch play out. But I'm very committed to making sure that we track it and bring you data. I think it's important that we you know, tie our spending to results and, and we hope to bring you those. Um, there is additional staffing as well. So we're gonna have at least four additional attorneys from the private uh, firm's highest staffing model, along with three social workers, two paralegals, and these three advocates. And what all of those um, folks are gonna do is they're gonna help us get closer to the national standards for public defense caseloads, which is really important because to be an effective advocate, you can't be drowning in work. You can't be playing catch up. You have to be able to sit down with each human being, look them in the eye, figure out what they need and provide really great representation. It also allows us to do early representation, which is going to keep people out of custody, get them home to their families and result in systemic savings that way. And then the structured supervision and the structured training is going to help us do better and help us be more efficient. So in these first you know, few years of a new agency, there's definitely some capacity building and some learning that we need to do. And I believe that this budget will position us to do that. Yeah, I think uh, we've got the best possible budget for a first year of operations. I'm curious, I mean, and you, you mentioned, um, you know, really kind of the total client support that's necessary. Um, obviously, our community is in desperate need of more housing, um, among among other things um, that will just help more work opportunities to support clients. Um, you know, as far as investments that this board could make directly and with the relative immediacy, um, I'm just curious to know now versus, you know, and of course we'll get your feedback uh, next year uh, again, but um, at the outset here, what do you think some of those most effective dollar for dollar uh, investments could be? Would it be investing more in restorative justice? Would it be um, additional case workers? What, what do you predict will... Um, well, you say, you know, immediate. And so I'm sure that building more houses is not the answer that you want. But obviously, housing is critical. Until we can house our clients, it's very difficult to really help them lift themselves up and out of the system. Uh, basic <coughs> needs, right? You know, beyond that, I'm really excited about having social workers in house who can coordinate with all of the advocates in every other part of the county system so that we get better at, for example, identifying beds for folks who need inpatient treatment, identifying outpatient support resources, really understanding better what our community already has to offer and mapping that internally so that our social workers every day can be on the phones calling people at all of our different housing resources, substance abuse, mental health resources and saying, how many beds do you got today? How many beds do you have for this type of client with this type of funding so that we can get people into the services they need to address root causes? I think that our um, investments, we just really need to focus on using our dollars in a way that provides direct client services. And as we've put together this budget, I've tried to keep you know, everything that we do really buoyed around supporting those people who are one-on-one -on -one with clients every day in the field, the courtroom, the jail, and our office. And I, I know that you work toward that as well as you think about funding. And I think that's the right strategy. How can we get the resources to the people that need them in the most efficient way? Uh, yeah, it does all come back to housing in many ways. Um, does, all right, yeah. is there any other comments or questions from board members? Uh, I, one more curiosity question. Sure. Uh, what What is the threshold for uh, financial threshold for a family, let's say, that they need a public defender? Uh, if they make too much, of course, they won't qualify. And uh, in today's economy, it seems like middle class really can't afford to have a private attorney. Yeah. So do, what, do you go from middle class or mostly uh, income? Uh, how, how low does it go? 
Sure, it's a really great question. And the California Supreme Court has answered it very pragmatically. And they basically say that in your individual community, you need to look at whether this person could afford a private attorney for this type of a case. And so in a place like Santa Cruz, you have to think about housing costs. You have to think about um, you know, how much attorneys cost and whether we have a, the right amount of attorneys to take that kind of a case that's before you. So it's a, a factor analysis that we will be able to do internally at the public defender's office. And then the court can always act as a backstop to that and say, well, you know, this one is borderline or, or this person doesn't quite meet the threshold. Um, but for us, the most important thing is to make sure that everybody's represented. Um, we find that um, the system works pretty well, that, that folks who are interested in hiring a private attorney and have the money to do so often do it right away. And those people who are struggling to hire an attorney, it's usually because they can't afford it. And that's when we step in and take over right. um, and, you know, keep an eye on it, of course, to make sure we're using our funds in an appropriate way. But I absolutely agree with you that it's really important that everybody have an attorney that's up there with them in court. Yeah. And one last, uh, uh, there's an overlap between criminal law and civil law. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, uh, Percentage wise, do you, uh, what, do you have some civil cases that you're handling and how does that relate? Uh, is that less than 50%? It's definitely less than 50%. So what we handle is um, any case that could lead to an involuntary commitment or to incarceration. And so in any situation where a person is facing a potential deprivation of liberty, the public defender steps in. And so, for example, we um, defend folks who are contesting conservatorships. Um, contempt proceedings that could lead to incarceration, we handle those. And then of course we represent um, all of the children in our community who are charged with delinquency, okay. um, with, which is a, a big percentage of what we do. So our bar is, um, is, there, is your liberty at stake? If your liberty is at stake, you're gonna have one of us standing next to you fighting for you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Cabot. If there are no other questions from members of the board, we'll proceed with public comment. If you'd like to comment on the public defender's budget, please approach the podium. Hello, good morning. My name is James Ewan Whitman. I appreciate this presentation and I really appreciate all the questions. Boy, the notes I took were really pretty cool. Um, and I don't know how it was that I, stated earlier that I spend significantly more time in the court system. I think I took like 12 pages of notes. It's not like you can take pictures or things. I was, those folks were, one was represented by a public defender. The other one wanted to represent herself. So I think this was just fascinating. I know that there's some stuff coming up where uh, some of the community involvement that I can do is I can submit a court paper that's gonna help a couple people in May, help this caseload with certain issues going on. I've submitted a couple court documents before and I'm just glad I decided to stick around and listen to this. This was excellent and thank you all for your questions. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. Good morning, my name is Becky Steinbrenner. I live in rural Aptos. Thank you for the presentation. I'm. Um, I'm curious to see how this goes. <laughs> I think it's a good new approach that's going to, um, if it works, will really make some, I hope, some long lasting changes for these people. As you said, Ms. Roger, it's disheartening to help someone get them off the hook, if you will, and then within weeks they're right back there. So that's the issue addressing recidivism. I um, wonder how many of these attorneys are being brought on uh, continuing from Bigham and Associates, the private firm that has done this work for the county under contract for a number of years. And that especially speaks to what I think is the very good idea of keeping the same defense team from day one for the clients. There are people in the system now. It's not going to be a clear slate come July 1. There are people in the system now that I think would really benefit if, if there is some sort of continuous representation. 
Um, I'm curious, and, and thank you, Supervisor Cabot, for asking the question about uh, civil versus criminal. What is the caseload like predominantly? Is it uh, drug related? Is it um, theft related? Is it domestic violence? What is the biggest need out there? What are, will your attention be uh, with priority to need? I have to take this opportunity to point out that uh, the man who is accused of killing Sergeant Gusweiler is coming under the um, umbrella of public defenders. So we have a huge caseload out there with a, a lot of needs. Um, I'm also in heartened to hear this, the pilot project that will happen in South County for ages 18 to 25. I'd like Thank to hear you, a little more about that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any uh, members of the public on Zoom that wish to speak? We have no speakers on Zoom, Chair. Okay, thank you. Then I'll return it to the board for action. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to remove the recommended action and welcome our public defender's office into the county umbrella. And thank you for everything that you have done and uh, what you're going to do. Uh, I have to say, I uh, there's a lot of people who said, boy, who would want to do that job? And when uh, we unanimously selected you, Ms. Rogers, to be public defender, we made the right choice of some very, very qualified candidates. It was great, but I'd move the public defender's office. For I'll second the motion. All right, motion by Supervisor McPherson second by Supervisor Caput to approve the 22-23 Public Defender's Office budget. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. Sedum passes unanimously. All right, that, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Public Defender Rogers and the entire Public Defender team. We will now proceed with item 45 to consider approval of the 22-23 proposed budget for probation, including any supplemental materials and take related actions as outlined in the reference budget documents and as recommended by the county administrative officer. And leading us off for our presentation, we have Chief Probation Officer Fernando Geraldo. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Coney. Good morning, Supervisors. Fernando Geraldo, Chief of Probation. Uh, with me today is my Assistant Chief, Valerie Thompson, and our CAO Analyst, David Brown, who will be helping me uh, uh, take a tour of the uh, our, uh, our website. It's my pleasure to be before you today to present our proposed fiscal year 22-23 budget. We appreciate the opportunity to highlight our operational plan achievements, successes, opportunities, and challenges. I also want to thank CAO Carlos Palacios and his staff for their continued support of probation and allowing us to fill, fulfill our vision and mission, which is driven by my innovative and passionate staff. I want to thank my staff for their dedication to some of our community's most vulnerable individuals. They inspire me each day and I'm so proud of them. Collectively, my staff are driven each day to support our clients on their ter transformative path to wellness and healing, and also serve as a connector and bridge to capacity building services provided by our wonderful community partners. Our goal is to promote public safety, reduce recidivism, and support victims and all those impacted by crime in partnership with our community. I also want to note that uh, in July, July 17th to the 20. Uh, third, it's recognized annually by our governor as Probation Services Week to highlight probation's immense contributions to our communities and state. Probation professionals across California are recognized for playing a unique and essential role in our justice system and communities. Probation is focused on helping justice system involved individuals transition out of the system permanently through transformative and evidence-based rehabilitation. Okay, now I'll show you an overview of our uh, departmental um, budget in just a moment. So as you see here is our mission statement, which would actually had just read that. Um, and this, um, 
site here provides you a really detailed overview of our budget and I've found it personally very useful uh, not having to sc scroll through hundreds of pages to find some uh, detail so it's uh, I think it's working well and I hope the public finds it very useful our proposed fiscal year 22-23 budget is 32.7 million dollars this is a 12 percent increase from last year due to increases in AB 109 allocations and significant growth revenue from last year Probation had a fiscal year 2021-22 mid-year adjustments related to the AB 109 growth uh, and SB 129 revenue that funded additional staffing and helped us balance negotiated salaries and benefit increases. We'll start uh, with our divisions. Uh, we have our juvenile hall division, which is funded primarily by general fund. Uh, but the role of Juvenile Hall has been and continues to be a uh, state mandate to provide temporary secure custody of youth of between the ages of 12 and 25 who were referred by law enforcement agencies, the probation department, and the court. The facility provides detained young people with the best possible conditions of confinement, a safe and secure environment, trauma-informed, where physical and mental health needs are met, and the least restrictive environment. Just to touch on an emerging issue that I've talked about a bit uh, before in last year's budget and a couple other times that I've been before you is the um, DJJ realignment, the transfer of youth in the state uh, a facility to local counties. Um, DJJ closed its uh, intake on July 1st, 2021, and it will close permanently in July 2023. Uh, one of the issues that we're, we face, and um, we can only sort of guess at this time is the fiscal impact for us because we're allocated a, a funding based on our um, historic uh, commitment rate and also demographics in the county and, and uh, crime, juvenile crime rates. Um, but we anticipate that uh, we may have a higher number than expected a youth who will need to go to the secure youth facilities track that could be an additional cost. So, but we don't know what that might be yet. I'll now move to our probation um, side of the budget, which supports the three divisions, adult services, juvenile services, as well as our new um, pretrial division. Adult probation services supports public safety through pretrial assessments, pre-conviction jail alternatives and monitoring, pre-sentence investigation reports, community-based supervision for individuals placed on formal probation, or those eligible for AB 109, an oversight of a high number of collaborative service engagement contracts that support really the outcomes that we're looking for, public safety outcomes through community-based contracts and our probation success center programming. On the juvenile division, juvenile services include intake, diversion, investigation, supervision for youth who reside both in the home environment as well as in out-of-home placement. Our intake unit completes investigations on active referrals and for, forwards information and recommendation, recommendations to the court. Uh, we're also very responsible in our juvenile uh, division for engaging families and natural supports to create an environment where youth and families can remain together and achieve success in their own communities. Uh, one of the emerging issues I'll just touch upon briefly, uh, as you see here, is um, is the expansion of pretrial services with SB 129, which actually brought in additional funding to the county, uh, going directly to the courts, but also to the county to support a pretrial expansion, which uh, last March I was before the board presenting on that and uh, how we're standing up a new pretrial division to meet those new demands. Uh, SB 129 funded help us um, actually fund two uh, previously vacant positions and also support the addition of a analyst as well as a director to oversee this entire new division that we that we're standing up. And we'll go to the this tab of the budget, which is the personnel details, which I think is great and it's transparent and anyone can go in and really look at uh, where the funding goes in terms of supporting staffing of our 132 fully funded staffing. You can see the different classifications, um, how many of those we have, what are the changes. For this proposed budget, 22-23, we're asking for the addition of a 0.5 FTE, which is an administrative position really to support uh, pretrial expansion uh, and all the details that are uh, that go along with that. That's a lot of, uh, a lot of paperwork, documentation, and, and moving um, cases uh, through the court system. Thank you. 
this slide really is uh, more uh, details of our budget, really in terms of our salaries and benefits comparing fiscal year 21 22 to our proposed fiscal year budget and you can see the changes there includes the services and supplies our revenue categories uh which as you heard earlier uh from our county budget manager that uh, most of our revenue in the probation department comes from state allocations and uh entitlement dollars as well as grants uh and with nine million of our 32 million dollar budget being general fund so a little less than a third um but we we appreciate the support of the general fund and it goes on to describe juvenile hall uh, as well, which is mostly funded by the general fund, a little over $5 million in that and some revenue and nearing close to $2 million. I'm gonna go on to our next slide. And, and really, you know, you, why am I showing a photo of Halloween? Cause it's uh, still, uh, we're just starting the summer, but uh, I just wanted to show this because last fall, my team team teamed up with the DA's office uh, and many other partners to support a very successful trunk or treat event at the Watsonville Fairgrounds. Hundreds of families and smiling children uh, drove through their car trunks wide open to get treats, books, public health information, and just really in seeing all the uh, costume folks delivering candy safely in a safe manner. Uh, supporting community events like this is just one of many examples where my staff get involved and, and serve others. So that's a photo of me it, i forgot my costume that day obviously but with my costume staff the, um, it was it was a fun event i look forward to, to many more events like that here's the agenda for today's uh, presentation i'm going to review our uh, juvenile hall uh, and the probation side which is the three divisions our proposed 22 23 budget supports 132 staff we staff the juvenile hall, pretrial services, adult and juvenile community supervision. We are also recommending the addition of a 0.5 FTE. Our proposed expenses are 32.7 million supported by 23.4 million in revenues and 9.2 million in general fund contributions. A little bit about our juvenile hall changes. There is a budget change of nearly $400,000 in 2020 three, which is almost all due to increases of salaries and benefits that are necessary to support the cost of existing staff with about an additional 35,000 to cover uh, HSA nursing costs and professional services. A lot of this is balanced by um, our, our MA activities, which is Medi-Cal administrative claiming, which our entire department is doing, which uh, this year, I'm very happy to say that we've brought in nearly a million dollars in revenue, which is astounding uh, considering the size of my department. It's a, it's a lot of work, but it's, it's, very, it's helped us in, in difficult times. On the probation side of the budget, there's a change of uh, 5.7 million, and that's really related to $3 million in revenue that we received, the unanticipated growth. Um, and then, and then and excuse me, the change is related to 3 million in expenditures and 2.7 million in revenues. These expenses are mostly due again to salary and benefit increases. Here's our proposed supplemental budget. Uh, there's really one item there that we've traditionally been supporting the Youth Action Network, supported the, the United Way. So $30,000 from the uh, Local Innovation Trust Fund, which uh, is through realignment, um, will support um, a network of youths, adults, and organizations working to increase youth well being in Santa Cruz. Um, some of the goals of the Youth Action Network our youth adult partnerships, which will increase youth supported by caring adults and relationships with local decision makers, youth voice, and youth development, which is really about increasing uh, knowledge of youth leadership. It's critical. This is, this, is, this is our future. Many of them will be in this role that I have and possibly in your role possibly as well. So uh, we're happy to support that. to talk about our juvenile hall division uh, for a moment, but the photo here on this slide illustrates how we've adapted and shifting during the COVID-19 pandemic. The young people detained in the juvenile hall are participating in a hybrid program provided by Music in May, which is a festival of chamber music uh, build, um, building community. Musicians from across the nation 
um, have brought this program to our facility. And this photo was taken just probably a couple of weeks ago, but you can see the hybrid version of that. You have some in-person musicians, but also others on, on the screen up there. So um, that's how we adapted and shifted. And we did that quickly right at the beginning of the pandemic. I wanna highlight a few major changes in juvenile hall. Uh, we have the STAR program, which is a reentry program. STAR stands for Stable Transitions After Reentry. It's a partnership between probation, encompass positive discipline and conflict resolution, and it provides young people transition and support linkages back into the community. It's a very, very important program. Uh, the expansion of Wi-Fi and secure tablets supports virtual visitation and hybrid participation for all detained young people, families, natural supports, court and pro program providers. And just as a note, we have opened the juvenile hall back up to visitation. We do it safely, but uh, our you know families can now go and visit youth. That's been going on for a couple months at least now, um, as well as our other service providers who do important programming for the youth in there. Um, one of the major outstanding issues that we have still is the completion of the multi-purpose gymnasium and renovation projects that will ensure adequate programming space and compliance with state requirements. As you know, we've been out of compliance for several years, but uh, the delays of this project um, have really resulted in some increased cost. Uh, uh, and then the project was supposed to replace uh, uh, an entire kitchen, a number of other things that are outdated um, and without the funding, um, coming into us yet. We've had to then just sort of piece together uh, different parts and, and not fully do what we want, but we anticipate uh, we'll be moving forward very quickly. In fact, yesterday the state approved um, uh, another, um, some documents that we had submitted that will help us advance the project. Talk a little bit about our juvenile division. Um, and the picture on this slide is from the grand opening of the Luna Isol Familia Center, which took place on March 30th uh, of this year. And this is a photo of Watsonville. That's on Madison Avenue. This is a new program. It's a one-stop center that's funded by the Board of State and Community Corrections. Uh, it was awarded to the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz, but probation is a partner with this and helping design this program. And that was the kickoff. And I just love this photo. It's just, you know, so colorful and re reflects uh, all the partners uh, coming together for something that's going to be great. But this is a one-stop hub in South County, and it provides linkages to basic necessity, life skills, development, academic support, job readiness, uh, and it fosters uh, community engagement. Just a quick reminder uh, of, again, DJJ realignment. It's transferring the responsibility of youth uh, who were normally have gone as 707B offenders, which are the most serious charges who could go to be committed at the state level can no, will no longer be committed. They'll be committed locally. And as you're aware that we have partnered with Sonoma County um, to provide uh, the secure youth facility track uh, and services needed for that. Um, and we, we are continuing to look for new options and expand that. Those options, there are, there are a few available that we're exploring, but right now Sonoma County is the, the closest to us. I know I've been asked to, if we have any neighboring counties that would host our youth and uh, the answer is, is no at this time, unfortunately, but I, I will keep trying. Move on to our adult division. These are just a couple of photographs that represent our first probation success center in Santa Cruz. That's at the top right in our new temporary location. Uh, bottom corner of the left this is in Watsonville. So while we're uh, building and uh, or remodeling, making the tenant improvements in the new Cal, uh, South County Service Center, West Ridge, where we hope to be able to have a success center and we will probation department will be moving in. We've leveraged a contract with leaders and community alternatives to identify a temporary location for a South County success center, similar to the one we have right across the street. It's already open. It's located on Freedom Boulevard near Airport Boulevard. We plan to have a grand opening July 15th and I will, I will send you all an invitation when we do that. New legislation continues to impact how we all do our work. For example, AB 1228 has reduced the period of probation supervision in many cases and necess necess necessitates really moving earlier and more robust engagement strategies. With less time, we need to move fast, especially up front. So we're, front, we're redesigning how we do supervision by front loading services. SB 129, as I mentioned earlier, and, and AB 129 have, have allowed us to actually bring in 
uh, mid-year, um, eight new positions um, last March, which is really going to help us uh, right size and, and really prepare for pretrial expansion uh, and the ongoing leg legislative changes. Lastly, this is our pretrial division. And this is a growing division. These are just some of the pretrial staff in this photo, um, which is taken recently at one of our uh, Wednesday staff meetings. That that is the day that the, all the staff over overlap. These these staff, uh, not all of them together, but uh, they have seven day. Uh, pro we provide seven day coverage, seven days a week, uh, year round, uh, in order to. Uh, service the jail and have a jail alternative program and that was really key especially at the start of the pandemic to uh, really create space for the for the units quarantine units there sb 129 requires the judicial council of california to distribute funding to all 58 california courts and county supervision agencies and provides them with the resources necessary to assist judicial officers in making pretrial release decisions based on the least restrictive conditions while ensure public safety we are uh, fortunate in this county to already have had a pretrial for uh, several decades locally so this funding has allowed us to enhance our program not start it from scratch like many counties are doing so uh, i'm very happy that our counties has always been forward thinking and we knew we needed a pro trial pre-trial program years ago we've expanded our pre-trial unit again adding two more probation officers an analyst a division director and we've actually moved a couple probation off uh, probation aid positions to the pre-trial unit to aid uh, with the expansion. And uh, the chart at the top right here really shows uh, how our average daily population has continued to grow. And we continue to have outstanding safety outcomes with uh, the majority of individuals appearing for court and not reoffending during their pretrial supervision. So big shout out to my, my pretrial staff, which probably I believe is the, the busiest unit in our entire department. State or federal opportunities and impact. Uh, there are a few of those. Um, the customized mobile probation van you see here is what we envision. We don't have that yet, uh, but this we envision this to be the future of, of probation and how we can meet our clients where they're at even better than we do now. We don't have a van like this, but there may be opportunities in the budget, governor's budget to uh, fund something that would support this. This is an emerging best practice in probation, but this these kinds of vehicles would allow us to reach uh, clients that uh, that are hard to reach or, or are missing appointments or in the different camps that, that we have here and allow us to do, you know, not only check in with them, but also uh, perhaps check in on, on their the battery on their monitor if they're on pre-trial services or even do remote court. Um, so Placer County is actually a, a model for this. So I'm looking forward to visiting their county to learn more about this. A couple of the impacts that we have, we have grants ending, Prop 47, um, Cohort 2. We were uh, 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 awarded that grant over three years ago and a total of $6 million. That grant is about to expire at the end of this year. Um, but I'm happy to say that our county uh, with probation, the district attorney's office and the public defender's office partnered to submit a new proposal uh, for cohort three for $6 million. And we're eagerly awaiting the news on that. We're supposed to hear sometime in June or in July. So fingers crossed. Um, Another opportunity really is Cal AIM for us, uh, and that's been particularly for incarcerated individuals. It allows them to um, start um, their uh, Medi-Cal that's suspended when you're incarcerated. This will allow it to be uh, started up again 90 days prior to release so then folks can get services and um, and, and be supported by Medi-Cal. So this has to be implemented in our juvenile hall um, uh, this January, coming January, 2023. So we're working on how we're going to, how we're going to implement that. Touch upon our um, probation operational plan successes and our objectives. We have many, but I won't go over all of them, just focus on a few. Uh, while focusing on objective 319 juvenile justice, my staff stayed busy preparing for and implementing for DJJ realignment over the past year and a half. And uh, a lot of that work was really partnering with Sonoma County, developing an MOU, going to the board for that approval, uh, and also just uh, uh, coordinating uh, the treatment plan uh, and how we're gonna support visiting and uh, a number of other things that are significant changes, but we've, we've managed to do that very well. 
Um, Juvenile Hall has remarkably not have a COVID breakout throughout this entire pandemic, which is extraordinary and a testament to the discipline and highly trained Juvenile Hall staff and medical team who kept everyone safe and healthy. So I'm just very proud of that. As per objective number 321, Juvenile Hall it pivoted to promote virtual family visits during the time it was not possible to hold in-person meetings. So we've expanded the use of tablets to support uh, virtual family visits uh, and maintain hybrid capacity for young people to stay in contact. Just reduces barriers. Uh, as you know, many of our youth, uh, today I have 13 youth in the facility. Majority of those youth are from South County, which is a, a distance uh, from, from Watsonville, primarily from Watsonville. So virtual access is just very critical to ensuring equity, equitable access to our families. Okay. For uh, objective number 322, our adult services division has stayed on track to meet our South County services objective. Uh, we opened a South County Success Center, have hired bilingual staff, and are working towards Spanish speaking services and programming. This concludes my presentation, and the recommended actions are, as, as you see here, approve the proposed budget for the probation department, including any supplemental material is recommended by the county administrative officer and i am ready for questions thank you for all the questions or comments from members of the board supervisor um uh, supervisor caput why don't you start yes it's okay hey thanks uh for the report and uh, uh the gymnasium is finally coming around huh Yes, yes, it is. Yeah, I was, uh, I'm trying to think of, uh, cause you know, we've been talking about that. This is my uh, ninth budget presentation. And I think my first one, I was uh, inviting everyone to come play basketball at the gym, and, but it is, it's a slow moving process. Uh, initially we were delayed significantly by the, uh, um, the June, I think it was the June beetle and a few other things, but we've moved far past that. And now, um, we are, we hope to break ground on that, um, uh, this coming spring. That's what we're truly hoping to. So we're like 80% or 90% of the way there to actually getting final, uh, uh, um, uh, the okay to go ahead and start that. Well, I'd like to take the first shot. Uh, <laughs> yes. On the <laughs> you will, you will all be invited uh, for that. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, keep up the good work and uh, appreciate all that you're doing County and, um, I don't know. Uh, does it look like uh, the last question, uh, uh, the trend uh, less uh, uh, youth that are that have to go to juvenile hall or? Locally, that has continued to be the case here. As you know, the, the narrative and dialogue nationally, um, you know, uh, many places um, are seeing, you know, spikes, spikes in crime um, and even in California, but that, whether that's a trend or not, I don't. I don't know if it. You know, that's just a, a something that's it that happens periodically. But locally, we're seeing uh, 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 our juvenile detention use of that just limited to the exception, which is really um, serious charges, which is generally uh, a, a t murder, attempted murder, a robbery, those kinds of things. So the those thirteen youth that we have in the facility uh, at the moment need that care. Uh, and, and to be in secure custody until we we figure out the right path to support them. And thank you. And nice seeing you at the tr trunk or treat. I know I gave you some candy, and you and your family were out there at the fairgrounds last October. So yeah, yeah, it was great to, that you supported that. <laughs> thank you, Supervisor Cabot. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I'm. Um, thank you, uh, our, our, our director. Um, Geraldo and uh, your chief assistant, Valeria Thompson, your whole team for your efforts. Um, this is another area where in the, uh, the state mandates have not been resourced uh, fully like we'd like them at times. But, you know, throughout all of that, the probation department for the 10 years I've been on the board and before that too going in, it's been recognized as a state model to be as being innovative, um, caring and professional in all senses of those words. Um, it, you really be commended and you're always looking forward. I also really especially appreciate the challenges you face during this COVID-19 crisis and how important it is to track how clients are doing uh, so safely and for the officers and the clients both. Um, one quite, how often in general will uh, an officer 
visit a client? It would be once a week or? Uh, that's a de a determined by the, the case mm -hmm. load that they're on in terms of their, their risk and need level. So I'll give you an example. There are folks who are on pretrial services, you know, it's pre pre sentencing awaiting court. Um, those individuals are often seen and some of them in cases weekly coming to the office or periodically we will, we will go out to their homes. Uh, uh, in fact, just the, the other day we had to go to a home. Uh, we had information that someone was, uh, um, potentially planning for something, let's say that pretty harmful. So, you know, we went out with our sheriff's office and conducted a search and thankfully everything worked out and, uh, we took care of the situation. So that's the pending circumstance, uh, made that a requirement. Um, but if you are on a general supervision caseload, meaning that, uh, you, you are generally not likely to recidivate and you have a lot of supports in place, uh, you might, you might be required to come in to the office, uh, every couple months. Um, then on the other side, we have our AB 109 population, which is post-release community supervision. That would require a, you know, a, a contact every 30 days to be out in the field, uh, in the office, and so on. You know, we've really learned uh, during the pandemic that a lot of the work we could do um, is also remote. We might say next month, or let's just check in remotely if you're doing fine, you know, we'll do a virtual contact with that capacity. And, and so not necessitating a necess necessitating a someone to leave work and come to the office just for a, you know, a 20 minute check-in. So it really depends on uh, the, the information that we have, the, the case, the, the risk uh, level that they have risk to recidivate uh, and information and often uh, maybe at the court's directive. Um, how often we'll be out, we'll be out in the field, but you know, we have folks out every day all over the County, um, conducting visits, just lot, largely it's a wellness checks. How you doing? Uh, do you need anything, you know, particularly during a pandemic, uh, we are handing out just a lot of, uh, things, vital things that, that families needed, um, to support them. We were even letting them borrow, um, you know, my so they can stay in communication with us. All right. Well, great. You're doing a great job. I was glad to work with your department in the food services program earlier, and we'll, I pledge to continue working with you on uh, working with the neighboring counties and see how we can cooperate some effort, be, do some things in a cooperative manner. Thanks Thank for you, support. Everybody. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Other comments or questions from board members? Just a quick one, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Director Geraldo. Uh, can you give us a sense as to how um, the sort of oversight of specific populations, um, sexual predators, people who've been charged with uh, have, are on probation from serious crimes, um, what that oversight looks like, and how are there any remaining challenges left over from COVID or other? Uh, other other impacts we've seen recently. Well, I, I'll start with the uh, what you call the uh, uh, our clients who are on probation for uh, for for sex crimes. Yeah, we have a, what we call a sex offender caseload, which probably has about thirty individuals, and these are individuals that are required to register uh, through the you know Department of Justice, and also required to uh, complete the mandatory sex offender program. It's a, a state mandated. Um, and so those those individuals are supervised, you know, very intensively. And a lot of that is, you know, going through their phones and computers, right, to make sure they're not uh, uh, doing things that are illegal and downloading things that that uh, that they, that that's illegal. Um, so that's a specialty type caseload that would have more frequent contacts. Um, and periodic searches uh, because of that level. We also have an intensive mental health caseloads, the most caseload, which is the maintaining ongoing uh, stability um, caseload uh, in behavioral court. Those are more intensive, um, meaning that these individuals are contacted uh, sometimes uh, a weekly, um, that we have, we'll go out and see them, whether they come to our office or wh whether we go to behavioral health offices or they might be in uh, residential programs. So that's that's one kind of a, uh, extreme of you know a lot of contact, similar to our juvenile caseloads, which we have the wraparound program, which these are youth who who could end up in out of home placement if not uh, given the support. Um, so we have to, to do very, very regular contacts with the families and the natural supports. Um, the impact of COVID, uh, absolutely, we saw across both the adults and juveniles, uh, which was uh, isolation, 
uh, and a lack of just engagement, particularly for our youth uh, in school. A lot of youth, as you know, like in PVUSD, they lost several thousand students, didn't know where they went and what happened to them. Um, so those students who already sort of disengaged, they weren't or weren't being engaged already, the pandemic really uh, lost a lot of those youth. So a lot of our work is to, to with our partners, is to team up and, uh, and get them back in, into school where they should be, in the right school, finding the right match for those individuals. Um, I hope that answers your question, but is it? Yeah, I guess uh, there was previously there was challenges around staffing levels and uh, number of uh, probationers per. Oh per, yeah, uh, yes. So um, is that a, or are we in a better? I think we're we're in a much better place with our mid-year yeah. adjustments. We had uh, a, we carried four vacant uh, um, unfunded probation officer positions for over two years. Uh, and that as pretrial numbers were continuing to grow, as you saw, uh, we certainly could have used those, but now um, we are hiring them. We have, you know, uh, when I came before the board, I had uh, permission to go ahead and do that. So that will really support us. And so I think we're, you know, there's a, there's certain uh, caseload standards, much like our public defender showed uh, in her chart, there is something like that uh, for probation and we're, we're getting closer to meeting that. I believe we actually have met that because of certain legislation, our, our caseload size have been reduced to, um, to the levels that we, we haven't seen before. Um, and, and a lot of cases are being diverted, leaving us though with some of the more, uh, you know, uh, high, higher need, higher risk type cli clients. When I say higher risk, meaning more likely to reoffend. And a lot of that is through due to substance use disorder, behavioral health issues, and so on. So, but uh, to answer your question, I think we're in, in, in a really good place right now. Great, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, just a couple of questions for you, uh, Chief Geraldo. Um, you mentioned in the, uh, as one of the emerging issues, the possible discrepancy between um, you know, what the funds we're receiving for realignment and, you know, the, the requirements and in, in terms of services we provide. I mean, it seems like there is some significant funding. I mean, if I'm reading this correctly, about $2.6 million in additional funding coming from the state um, and about a million dollars in additional service contracts. I assume that's this, for example, potentially the Sonoma contract. For, for, for realignment specifically, we we know our what our three three year allocation is. And so for our current fiscal year was 250,000. For year two, we will get 22, 23. It's about 500,000. And then in year three, we'll, we will get $900,000 to support that. Um, I mean, you know, right now we have uh, just one youth that's been committed, which clearly that would su support that. Um, and, but we've done some calculations. And if, if for instance, uh, I'll give you an example, we have six youth in DJJ right now um, who were there um, committed before they stopped intake, but they will all need to continue to serve time once DJJ closes, which is in July of 2023. So they will have to come back, serve time in a potentially Sonoma, but we will have to pay, pay to, to cover that six youth. And I, I don't believe that the amount allocation that we have currently would cover those that expense. So that's sort of the, the dilemma that we're, we're at. Even with those increases of 500,000 and 900,000? Yes, I believe so, because those commitments then um, um, could be, at one time we actually had about three years ago, we had almost uh, nine youth at one time um, in DJJ, not committed at the same time, but uh, because of the way they serve our sentences, they all happened to be there. And uh, that time, of course, the state was covering most of that. But if that were to happen, and we hope we don't, hopefully uh, with our you know partners and strong work to go upstream, we you know will 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 really prevent that from happening. But these are these are what ifs. But I think it's just important to acknowledge that the potential for that um, is a big responsibility for all counties after the state decided to close the commitment facility um, and pretty much said counties figured out without getting a lot of money. And, and what's that schedule to anticipate those six youth coming back under our responsibility this year? Uh, no, it would be uh, next July, 2023. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and I believe they will have still have time left from their commitment to serve. Uh, and the question and challenge is, 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 you know, would Sonoma take all six of those? 
uh, particularly after youth have already been in a commitment facility, they're going to be older. These could be youth that are, uh, or young adults, actually, you know, 20, 21, 22, going into a, a facility, a secure youth track with others who are 16. So these are all logistical issues that all chiefs are struggling with and urging the governor actually to reconsider uh, that hard closure. Yeah, it sounds like a challenge we'll have to continue to grapple with. Uh, it's, you know, it's great we're making these investments in Juvenile Hall. Um, and I mean, I know the capacity of that facility is somewhere around like 60 or in the- it, It's 42-bed you know, 42 42. capacity, yeah. Okay. We have 13 uh, there today. Okay. But yeah, we've we've been under capacity, fortunately, for for a number of years. And as we, I mean, as we create a really state-of-the-art facility with the, um, with the, you know, the gardening and kitchen programs and the gym, um, is there any opportunity to rent some of that space to other counties? Is there any demand? Um, that's a, that's a good question. We've we've never, you know, explored that possibility. I think um, there isn't a demand because a lot, a lot of our neighboring counties, um, for instance, Monterey County uh, built a new juvenile hall. And I forget how many beds they have, like 150 beds there and are probably half full. Um, same as Santa Clara, all, all counties have done a great job uh, for a variety of reason, reasons, reducing uh, the, the number of youth who are in detention. So I don't believe that'd be, be a high demand for that, but that something that we could explore, you know, if we, um, after the, the renovation and, and so on. Um, but uh, I don't, yeah, I know the neighboring, the Bay Area counties are, are are not are not looking it's we who are looking actually particularly for our djj our realigned youth okay thank you if there are no other comments or questions from board members is there any member of the public that wishes to address us on the probation budget thank you my name is becky steinbrenner i'm a resident of rural aptos I didn't see any mention at all of the um, facilities that I know to be present in the Mid-County Safety Center. Probation has a couple of offices there. Um, at least they did when I went with uh, for a meeting there. So um, can you please talk about if it does still exist there and how much it's used, the county is paying quite a lot of money to the Aptos Village Project developers for the use of that space. Um, I didn't see clearly how much Prop 172 money probation is getting. Is that part of the 23 million intergovernmental revenues or where is the Prop 172 money and how much is that? Um, I am really glad and hopeful that there will be a gymnasium <laughs> come about, but I wonder because of where that site is, if there are other physical activities that are done there to just get these youth out and moving out in the outdoors. It certainly is in a beautiful place and could be making use of what is already there. I. I saw your seed to table um, project and something that it would be completed by 2024. That's been something that I have advocated, uh, getting, getting these youth out, busy, connecting with the earth, growing food, raising animals, and um, really developing a sense of relationship with something in a nurturing way, I think would be very helpful for these people. I also want to, before my time runs out, say that I uh, really would like to encourage visits to these clients because you can get a lot more information by doing that than on a Zoom meeting. And that often helps seeing a bigger picture. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Steinberner. Is there anyone on Zoom? We have no speakers on Zoom, Chair. Sure. You just quickly address the question about uh, any mid-county facility. Sure, yeah, we have, uh, have, probation has a uh, an office at Aptos Village and we have uh, three staff there who are permanently, uh, they're our pre-sentence investigation unit. They've been there throughout the pandemic and, uh, and we have another office uh, and the purpose was to have a floating office. And for instance, uh, myself uh, will often stop by there and hold hold meetings there because we have a nice conference room and uh, we'll have management team meetings um, during the pandemic, uh, a little bit less traffic uh, for obvious reasons. But now that we're 
Uh, we've never shut down, but we're fully back. Uh, that office is pretty full. Great, thank you. All right, uh, motion would be in order. We move the recommended actions to approve the probation department budget. Second. Motion by Supervisor McPherson, second by, by Supervisor Friend. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. This item passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Probation budget being approved for 22-23. Thank you, Thank you. Ms. Thompson, Geraldo, Mr. Brown. Uh, we'll now take a short 10-minute break. We'll uh, resume at 10.55 a.m. to hear the DA's budget. Thank you.
So we're all <laughs> I am at your service. now resume the budget hearings for the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors and we'll move on with item 46 to consider approval of the 22-23 budget for the district attorney public uh, public administrator including any supplemental materials and take related actions as outlined in the reference budget documents and for a presentation on this item we have our district attorney Jeff Rosell. Thank you uh, Chairman Koenig. I want to first take this opportunity to thank uh, all of the board members for uh, being able to uh, be here today and to present our budget. I want to thank uh, from the CAO's office, Carlos Palacios, Marcus Pimentel, Nicole Coburn, and uh, Sven Stafford, our uh, direct administrative analyst for the hard work that they have put into uh, helping us get the budget that we need to properly protect public safety in Santa Cruz. I also want to thank uh, the two chief deputies uh, from the DA's office that are here, Tara George, uh, chief of uh, criminal prosecutions, the attorneys, uh, investigative staff, and Eric Seib, chief of administration uh, for all of their hard work and also for the entire staff of the DA's office. We truly operate on a team basis and without the hard work and dedication of all those folks, uh, we would not be able to protect public safety as it, as it were. And before I talk about our proposed budget, I do wanna just take a moment to thank the board for its continued support of the DA's office and for its support of public safety. So uh, we tend to get right into the ask, but I just think it bears uh, mentioning and acknowledgement that you folks are the ones who have provided the financial means to our office to ensure the public safety of this community that we are also blessed to live in. So I wanna thank you uh, for that. And the first thing that I wanna talk about is consistent with your supporting us and public safety is that the California Constitution lays out that really public safety is the first responsibility of local government and local government officials have an obligation to give priority to the provision of adequate public safety and services. And you all deserve credit for doing that with our office uh, over the past years. The second thing I wanna talk about is the DA's office. What are our duties? Well, our duties to follow the United States Constitution, the California Constitution, California statutes, and rules of professional conduct. It's also our duty, our solemn duty to protect the rights of victims, protect the rights of defendants, review cases, investigate them, and to prosecute cases when appropriate. Our duty is to seek justice and to act ethically. The mission statement from our office is to promote and ensure public safety through ethical and just prosecution. And this literally hangs on our wall and is the driving force for everything we do. It is our guidepost. Uh, it's the North Star for the DA's office. And the DA's office gets uh, referrals on criminal cases and some civil cases from all of the sources and some other sources that aren't listed on this slide. These, these cases are investigated, 
uh, by the various police agencies. They are forwarded to our office for review. We are by no means a rubber stamp for law enforcement. We independently evaluate cases and make determinations about A, whether a person committed a crime, B, whether uh, we should file that case, whether we have enough evidence to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt, or whether we should enter into some sort of alternative uh, programs of which we can discuss later. The proposed budget uh, from 2023 is going to be uh, called up on the slide for the county. And I just wanna say uh, the county really, the CAO's office in particular, should uh, take some pride in the fact that they have through innovation and some vision, been able to provide uh, a very transparent, streamlined, and easy to access summary, not only of the DA's office's uh, budget, but of all the other agencies in this county's budget. So we're looking at a criminal prosecution slide. You can see the total expenses at the top of that slide. Uh, and you can see uh, emerging issues, services. It's really kind of one-stop shopping and all sort of laid out uh, in one space. And the next slide that is also on the website uh, specifically focuses on uh, staffing, consumer protection, victim witness, and criminal prosecutions. The DA's office is made up of three divisions. One is the criminal prosecution division, which does what it sounds like it does. The second is the consumer protection environmental division. And these are lawyers that are dedicated and staff that are dedicated to protecting consumers from uh, fraudulent claims by various people from automatic renewal we've seen with gym memberships and those sort of things and in protecting the environment the bay uh, stream bed alteration and a lot of other things and finally the victim witness uh, division is literally designed they do outreach but they are designed also to assist and help victims navigate their way through the criminal court system so um those are essentially the three sort of divisions and how they break down. Here we go. So you can see in a nutshell, as you've seen with the other departments, our proposed budget for 2023. Um, we have laid out uh, sort of the differences in what we're asking for this year. And those differences are we are asking for two fully funded uh, attorneys. We're actually asking for those attorney positions that we had to be refunded. And the reason that those were unfunded is the DA's office has always in the past when we had lean budget times, which I know you will remember, tried to ask for what we need. I can't tell you how many times I've come to the board and said, I have really asked for what we need, uh, not to try to just empire build or uh, pad numbers or anything like that. So we're asking for the refunding of those two full-time attorneys due to the backlog uh, based on uh, pandemic and a lot of changes in legislation that have really sort of increased the workload for the DA's office. We are also adding in terms of a full-time employee for an office assistant three. This is somebody who will assist in production of discovery. Uh, which is literally the police reports, all of the body cam footage now that we have, all of the uh, media information, uh, phone information, computer information that is now literally uh, so voluminous on almost every single case that we touch. We really need to uh, catch up, frankly, and having another office assistant who can focus on that is, is something that is important to us. The other issue uh, is this adding for the first time these three paid law clerk assistants. And what we're interested in doing here is providing 
uh, sort of an avenue for those folks who couldn't afford to take an unpaid law clerk sort of uh, job. People who, uh, frankly, will help us uh, increase equity, increase diversity, and increase, as you might imagine, in the legal profession, uh, people who, who come from different socioeconomic backgrounds that might not be able to afford to take an unpaid law clerk position. So we think it's in line with the county's vision. We, uh, we are very pleased to do that. And we are really pleased to have the support of the CAO's office in that and having that align with uh, the county's um, vision and uh, goals. So uh, the MDIC, this is something that we can talk about. This is the multidisciplinary interview center, a child friendly center that was developed uh, by the DA's office. It has the support of all of law enforcement in the county. And it is something that we are coordinating with social service agencies, as well as law enforcement to minimize the number of interviews on children. So we are working on trying to get uh, more robust Spanish speaking interviewers uh, for the center and to close some of the, the gaps that we have now and to make the transition to uh, having somebody on call in a very sort of easy way, fast and seamless. The increase in expenses that you can tell are essentially uh, due to scheduled negotiating staff costs and a new case management uh, system, which I will talk about at the end. So one of the three divisions, the criminal prosecution division is where we have asked for the staffing changes that I have addressed for you. And I have talked a little bit about these uh, issues and why we want uh, those staffing requirements uh, to be met and how we think that is going to assist the DA's office. And it's essentially laid out here. Technology, uh, strengthening pathways for diversity, and as well as addressing increased demands on our office through le new legislation and the COVID backlog. So uh, the status of uh, our objectives, I have listed uh, the last one, the CJC council I haven't spoken about that is listed here, 308. And the DA's office partnered and worked with the criminal justice council to evaluate and improve local public safety procedures and policies. Uh, this report was completed in November, 2020, 2021, and it was essentially talking to people who have been through the system, finding out what their experiences are, and then taking that information in to see how we can better respond to those folks who are frankly involuntarily in the system. The next thing that I wanna talk about, and I heard the public defender touch on it a little bit, is uh, the DA's office, uh, along with the Conflict Resolution Center and probation have started literally, I wanna say the fourth example in the state of a neighborhood court. Well, a neighborhood court is something where community members uh, essentially become uh, involved talking about causes, addressing root causes for low level criminal offenses. People who go into this, it's not about guilt or innocence. They need to admit their guilt and it is about addressing the root causes. And uh, it is something that has been incredibly successful. To date, we've had 63 total conferences uh, with community members and uh, there's still some that are in the works. It takes about two months to complete the process, but we've had 51 participants successfully complete this program. And by completing it, what it means is that they are not filed on in the court system, that if they complete it successfully, they are essentially diverted. They don't wind up with criminal charges. And we have had remarkable results uh, in this, we have had a lot of folks who have come in who have uh, done dumb things, who have committed low level crimes that are not recidivating, that are literally addressing their issues. We've had examples where they have literally wanted to thank the police officer who arrested them. Uh, and I gotta tell you that in our business does not happen very often. So this is an incredibly successful partnership 
uh, that the DA's office spearheaded that we are very excited about. And I think it's uh, a lot of upstream work and it, it's really designed to help people get their lives back on track. In the second division, the Consumer Environmental Protection Division, um, there's a lot of things that are uh, taking place. There was, as the board knows, uh, a lot of fire-related fraud investigations after our CZU lightning fire. So they have been educating the community and combating that. They have continued to investigate and have really focused in the last couple of years on nursing homes and elder abuse. Um, automatic renewal subscription cases, which I mentioned, and really doing a lot of front end outreach so that we can educate uh, people about the ever changing fraud schemes that are out there. Uh, and we really uh, are also looking at ongoing claims about med medical remedies and dietary supplements and those sort of things that are frankly misleading uh, that people are being conned into to using. On the environmental front, uh, we have identified some of the objectives that we're interested in, and it really is outreach. Like I say, in the DA's office, we have small opportunities, although in consumer protection, larger opportunities to prevent people from entering the system as victims. So we have uh, increased our presence and want to increase it in the EDD task force produced PSAs, both in English and Spanish, to educate the public as to fraud and schemes that are out there trying to take advantage of them, and also working with APS to produce uh, PSAs focusing specifically on elder abuse. The Victim Assistance Program, the third branch of the DA's office, as you can see, we uh, are focusing on recruitment and retention of those folks. We are emphasizing diversity and inclusivity of victims. That was also part of what I spoke about earlier uh, in our partnership uh, with the Criminal Justice Council, uh, trying to sort of identify where we can do a better job and also trying to align with the county's blueprint for shared safety. So uh, the ensuring uh, th that the MDIC is running smoothly, I spoke about a little bit, and that is this Spanish speaking interviewers. Uh, we need to make that program more robust. We're working on that and we're working on, uh, you know, still communicating and coordinating with local law enforcement agencies to use the facility for something even outside of children who are direct victims, but children who are witnesses to crimes. Like I say, it's a child-friendly interview center. And if you haven't been there, I would encourage you uh, to reach out to us. We're happy to take you there. And it's the first of its kind in this county ever. And it's something that we should be very proud of as a county. And I know as a DA's office, we are proud of. The second uh, sort of prong we're, we're dog we're working on is a facility dog for that multidisciplinary interview center. We have a dog already associated with the DA's office to assist victims who go into court. Uh, it's a essentially a comfort dog. It's a, a dog that is there to provide emotional support for people. It's a, a model that we are very um, blessed to have. And it's something that we want to expand out into the multidisciplinary interview center. And finally, uh, we are also working on a major new case management system. Since 2003, we have had a system which has functioned uh, better than what we had before, but we need a new system and we have been blessed to work with the CAO's office to get a new case management system. And this system, like I say, pushing out discovery, pushing out information to the defense, all the body cam video footage, all of the, the media information, the phone information, the phone records, the computer records, uh, all of that stuff have turned cases that, you know, I can remember in the old days would be uh, maybe a half an inch thick to the average file now is several inches thick with all this information. It requires us to process it. It requires us to push it out to the defense in an efficient way. And this new case management system will allow us to do that. And by getting that information out quickly and efficiently and comprehensively, we are able to uh, reduce 
court appearances. We're going to try to streamline cases and get them resolved in a quicker fashion. Because as you might imagine, if uh, defense attorneys don't have all of the information, it's difficult for them to do a complete assessment. So um, that is literally sort of the last uh, large piece of our budget. And at this point, I just want to say I would ask the board to approve the 2023 budget. I'm happy to take questions from any of you. And I want to thank you once again for your continued support for public safety um, and also for the support of our office. Thank you very much, District Attorney Roselle. Other questions or comments from members of the board? Supervisor McPherson. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to thank the district attorney, Jeff Rosell, and your team, uh, Ms. Tara, Ms. C, Bad, Mr. Stafford, of CA's office for your ongoing great work. And uh, especially at this time and this year, uh, for the respect you've had in the past, and you certainly have exhibited that in, as we go into having our own district attorney under the county or district public defender under the county umbrella. Um, it's it's very impressive and uh, it, it's highly respected by everyone involved. Um, like other justice departments, I know that COVID has presented you some uh, the number of challenges when it comes to trial schedules and uh, meeting with witnesses and evaluating evidences and thank you for getting through this. I hope that COVID um, experience we've, we've, uh, we've had is going to be over. And I'm glad to see a modest increase in your staffing uh, as the, the, to address the backlog of cases. And I really especially want to thank you. And this is another example of Santa Cruz County being out in front for your continued work on the neighborhood courts concept. I think, I don't know how many of of uh, those courts are in the state now, but I know we are one of a few to begin with. Uh, and I, I think um, it's an that's an important investment in reducing our overall crime numbers of justice involved and reducing uh, citizens uh, that uh, need some help and re reducing recidivism. Um, a couple, a question. Um, uh, the Consumer Protective Services, has that been increasing in recent years or over this last year? We have had various increases. Do you, are you talking about um, like the, the issues, the constantly evolving issues that are taking place, the fraud issues? Yes. Yeah, it's... It's funny because you you get a handle on one sort of scam and before you know it, there's a new scam. I got one on my phone today that your UPS package needs to be tracked. And really all they're trying to get you to do is to click on that phone and, uh, you know, uh, give them some information. So uh, the answer is those are constantly evolving. And as those evolve, our outreach evolves. And uh, I, I hate to say it, but it almost is never ending. Like as, as quick as we explain, it's the jury duty scam or it's the, your, you know, your granddaughter in Mexico got arrested scam. They're coming up with, with new scams one after the other. So it is something that we are committed to. Uh, sort of pushing out information, like I said, so that we don't have sort of back end victims. If it just um, directly, if, if somebody had a question and it just happens daily, who do they call? What's the number they call? We have, if you go to the district attorney's website, there is an actual consumer complaint form that you can fill out online and that comes into our office and we review those. If people want to uh, speak on the phone to somebody before they do that or instead of doing that, they are all welcome to call the general number for the DA's office and we will put them in touch with somebody who will will listen to their consumer complaints. And what we find is oftentimes uh, people who fill out the online applications, it's a consistent theme. It's a new scam. It's the PG&E turned off your power scam uh, or is going to if you don't pay, you know, in gift cards and, and those sort of things. So it's constantly evolving, but it's something that we are deeply committed to uh, in terms of providing public service sort of uh, announcements. And also, uh, as as you know, Supervisor McPherson meeting with constituents for any of the board members, uh, and particularly vulnerable constituents, yeah. we're happy to go do trainings on that. So, okay. Well, congratulations on your foresight and uh, continuing service to the people, as you say, in the constitution, public safety is our first responsibility. Uh, cooperative effort and congratulations on being uh, reelected on a post. Thank you.
Thank you, Supervisor. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Friend. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Roselle and the entire team. You know, I just wanted to point out uh, that it's a very progressive and forward-thinking budget that you're putting forward over the last few years we've worked on, even during the pandemic, a number of initiatives together from uh, the great uh, fraud trainings that Doug and others on your team have provided to constituents within my district, to the work that we did together on the MDIC, and to see it uh, expanding to ensure complete access is, is pretty remarkable. I, I really uh, am supportive of the idea of the paid block clerk program. I think that that is uh, absolutely necessary. The, the county, um, and I believe that uh, the CAO is, has really taken a strong stand on this, is really trying to work to ensure that we can have uh, the next generation of talent and that we don't uh, shut the door on any potential people that would be wonderful county employees. And I think that your program, this program would be an outstanding option. And, and to just highlight the criminal justice council work as you and I serve, obviously I'm the chair, but we serve on the executive uh, board together. You know, it's really, uh, it's been really remarkable to see what, what we've been able to do in our local law enforcement community, including through your agency uh, on regional collaboration and forward thinking in that, that regard has been obviously recognized nationally, but uh, the recognition is irrelevant. The changes and the progressivism that have been shown in this community uh, and the, the really unified approach, even from what would traditionally be viewed as disparate interests like the DA's office, public defender, probation, nonprofit organizations, really coming together to say what's the best approach to addressing frontline law enforcement issues, uh, including root cause issues has been pretty remarkable. So I appreciate that you've you've had a, a, a strong hand in that over time and I'm looking forward to supporting uh, this budget. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Supervisor Caput. Uh, first, okay. Well, how are you doing, Jeff? I'm doing I'm doing fine. <laughs> Thank you for asking, Supervisor Caffet. You're welcome. Uh, by the time I'm just going to make a statement. I don't have any questions. Uh, uh, when I was a kid uh, and growing up, and all the way till now, uh, the district attorney's office. If you look at the history of it, it's uh, it's had a lot of drama in all the years. I go back to uh, when I was uh, young and I was first reading uh, District Attorney Moore. Uh, he helped <coughs> the Register Paharonian get their Pulitzer Prize for uh, reporting uh, because of some improprieties. <coughs> then of course, Peter Chang uh, came in and uh, and we've had we've had good ones and uh, not so good ones. But it just seemed like there was a lot of drama. Uh, you know, after a couple of years, there'd be another big drama going on with the DA's office. And then, of course, your personal friend and mine, yeah. uh, Bob Lee, uh, a fellow alumni from Santa Clara. So uh, anyway, uh, he had very big shoes to fill. And uh, this is a compliment. Uh, are you as good as Bob Lee? <laughs> yes, you are. I would, I would. That's what I. That's a big compliment. Oh, so, good. anyway, uh, thank you, and uh, hopefully we'll have some more years without a lot of drama in your office. I, I want to say thank you, Supervisor Caput. I owe uh, more than I could uh, tell you to my dear friend, uh, colleague, and mentor, Bob Lee. And I've been in the office since 1994, and I lived through a lot of that, <laughs> uh, different DAs, and not Bob, but before Bob's time. And believe me, it is our mission to promote and ensure public safety. And the way that we do that is by not having internal drama and by moving forward. So I appreciate your comments. I appreciate you mentioning my dear friend. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Attorney Rizal. I, I too appreciate the progressive efforts and also, frankly, the nuts and bolts thing of, of improving um, your technology and creating more access for law clerks. It, 
it makes tons of sense. Um, everything you're doing, I guess, uh, I want to take a step back and ask you the big picture question, which is, um, <clears throat> getting an enormous amount of frustration from the general public about, um, criminal justice in California. Um, and I'm wondering one, what you're seeing locally in terms of rises, rise or fall or staying the same of crime rates. And then secondly, um, as the state has experimented with all kinds of reforms, is there anything we can do locally to get better outcomes than maybe we're seeing across the rest of the state? So I will say that, you know, uh, I think you're talking about um, various district attorneys in, in certain areas, one of which has been recalled uh, at this point, and another who looks like you may be on track for that. All I can say is this, uh, the, our DA's office has tried to be a, a blend of progressive uh, sort of thoughtful solutions when appropriate, but also understands that need people need to be held accountable for the things that they do. And so that balance is something that we strive to achieve every day. Um, crime rates in various instances have gone up, property crimes, those sort of things. Um, and some of that I think is due to COVID issues when people are not housed and you know are not acting responsibly. Uh, if they're out, uh, they're probably not going to be acting responsibly until there's some sort of an intervention and, and that sort of thing. So I don't think those are, are a surprise. In terms of what we can do, uh, I will say this, uh, and the people of Santa Cruz County are should be uh, understanding how blessed they are. Law enforcement in our county works together. Uh, law enforcement in our county, from probation to all of the police agencies, this MDIC, you know, taking the children to this interview center with buy in from every agency. We do not. Uh, have conflict that exists in other counties. We work together, we have a common goal. And uh, frankly, you even see it with the public defenders who uh, you, you heard the public defender mention uh, our support and we are supportive of the public defender. Uh, we may have differences on uh, cases, you know, here and there and what we think about for sure. But at the end of the day, we are all striving to uh, make Santa Cruz County a safer place. So I would say a long way to get to the point of the continued cooperation and the support that this board has provided us and the other law enforcement agencies, I think is is probably the most important thing that I can identify at this moment. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. Uh, you know, I know addressing the backlog of cases is a huge priority for you. And it's good to see in this budget that we're adding those two additional attorneys to help with that. Um, just to give us a sense, how big is the backlog that, today and, and what kind of progress are you going to be able to make? With these? We, we are going to make progress on it. We have already talked to the public defender about trying to sit down with cases. It's difficult. We had a period of about eight months initially where cases are not going to trial. And as you might imagine, um, without sort of the uh, trial date looming, a lot of cases don't resolve. Some do, some don't, but there were clearly probably more cases than if we had consistently been able to impanel juries, uh, uh, fewer cases were resolving. We then resumed for a while and we have had trials here and there. And then there was a period of in 2021 where it was very difficult to get cases out. So there is a backlog, uh, you'll, you, you, we know that uh, getting specific numbers is a very difficult thing. We've tried to look into the court system and our own and it's difficult to get exact numbers. But I can say with confidence uh, that you have highly motivated individuals from law enforcement uh, the DA's office and the public defender uh, to get these cases moving in to get us back on track to where we were. And we do appreciate refunding those two attorney positions. And we think that that will really, really help us get where we need to be. So if you had to estimate, is it, are we uh, I, I, I knew this was going to come up. I, I wouldn't say thousands. I would say uh, we're probably talking uh, maybe an extra thousand. It's very difficult to put a number on. I've asked the courts and I can't get a, I don't get a very clear number there. And it's difficult because when you, you and I talk about cases, is it the same individual who has multiple cases? Because if that individual was not housed and wasn't didn't have a trial date, they have now picked up other cases. So if you want to go by individuals, it's one thing if you want to go by cases. So all I can tell you is it's a difficult number to put a finger on despite us trying. Mm -hmm. 
about it. Yeah, and, and certainly the progress with the neighborhood courts is really encouraging, especially those outcomes as far as um, you know, no no recidivism and um, I mean just the the quality of the outcome for the participants. Um, do you see, I mean, is there an opportunity to continue to expand that? Yes, we are We are working on a monolingual uh, court uh, so that it can address people who uh, aren't speaking English in, in Spanish primarily. And so, yeah, it is a program that we are really excited about. We spooled it up slowly just to make sure that, you know, the kinks and the bugs were, were out of it. But it's clearly something that we believe can be expanded, that we are interested in expanding. And like I said, these are people who will wind up successful without criminal records who are not coming back and frankly have some appreciation. And you have community members who, you know, in the past have been frustrated business owners or various people who wanted to get involved and now that ha can have a direct dialogue with somebody who is taking responsibility, who has committed a low level offense. Great, thank you. Thank you. We'll now take public comment on the district attorney's budget for 22-23. Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrenner. I live in rural Aptos. Um, I am very grateful for the consumer protection and the environmental legal help. Uh, when uh, Mr. Brown, the, the main leader of that was, was brought on a few years ago, it was my understanding that that department is self-funding. Is, is that still the case? And um, if so, I'd like to see that change. I was very grateful for Mr. Brown's help in um, getting some action um, that resulted in the Aptos Village project developers having to be held accountable. Like you said, people have to be held accountable for what they do. And nothing would have happened with that whole soil contamination, pulling the tank out and hauling it in the middle of the night away and covering it all up. Nothing would have happened at all about that if it had not been for Mr. Brown's help. And that came about from the uh, insistence that it be from the county environmental health itself. So I'm grateful that for that department. I would like to know if, if it's still self-funded. I would like to support it publicly being funded if it isn't. Um, I would like to ask, I'm supportive of the neighborhood courts. I would like to ask that one case in particular, we talk about people just doing stupid things. The uh, whole tire skid thing across the Black Lives Matter mural in downtown Santa Cruz, I think that is a perfect example of something that should be in neighborhood court, not being prosecuted at a higher level, which I think your office has announced it intends to do. So I, I hope that that can go instead to a neighborhood good court. How much is the child uh, friendly interview space being used? I've heard in previous budget reports that it is very little used. And um, while I like having a dog there, there's some kids that are really afraid of dogs. And I think having smaller animals would be a benefit. And I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Feinberger. Uh, Gary Arnold, there is talk of the uh, cooperation between the various departments and so forth. Uh, uh, a lot of attempts for so-called uh, fusion has been uh, uh, ending up on the uh, people's side by their being run around from a, a district attorney to a sheriff or whatever. And what I'm talking about is uh, that has to do with uh, politics today where people are being threatened. There were two supervisors on this board of uh, directors that threatened the Granges, I think most of you have a Grange in your districts. Um, both the people and the property were threatened by phone, uh, by people that will testify. Uh, that's to the sheriff and to the district attorney. The two of the supervisors uh, you know, made those threats. That has been a squash on free speech for a long, long time. And if somebody uh, can tell me how we can get the people that we elect uh, responsible and uh, answering to uh, threats for speech. This one speaker happened to also have spoken at the resource center, so it wasn't uh, uh, that much different if you're looking at you know, just aiming across the political spectrum. Uh, it was a, a speaker that should have been allowed to speak and it's put a quill on, or, or a, a, a wet blanket on other people that want to use those facilities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Uh, 
Hi, my name is James Ewing Whitman. I'm glad that the DA's office is going to um, get more funding and have more assistance. I hope anything that I submit to the DA's will be of use in this county, this state, and this nation to set precedents. So thank you, it was nice to witness this. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. Is anyone else here in the chambers? Is there anyone on Zoom? We have no speakers on Zoom, Chair. All right, thank you. Then uh, I'll return to the board. And um, just if you could quickly address one question about this self-funding of consumer protections. I do see in the budget the uh, revenues of about $2 million. I mean, does that fully cover the cost of the consumer protection? No, provision? consumer protection is funded uh, by various sources. As I indicated, one of the ways uh, that consumer uh, affairs brings in money uh, is it goes into, frankly, the county coffers, and then it can be used to fund various things. By law, uh, the money is required to go back into funding consumer protection uh, actions. So that does take place for the, the balance of that. Okay, thank you. All right, a motion would be in order. Mr. Chair, I'll move the recommended actions. I'll second. Motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Caput to adopt the 22-23 District Attorney's Budget. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. The item passes unanimously. Thank you. All right. Thank you to the DA team. We'll now proceed with the final item on our regular agenda, which is to consider approval of the 22-23 proposed budget for the sheriff coroner, including any supplemental materials and take related actions as outlined in the reference budget documents and as recommended by the county administrative officer. Welcome and for a presentation on this item, we have Sheriff Jim Hart. Thank you, Chair Koenig, Board of Supervisors, Jim Hart, Sheriff Coroner. And uh, with me today is our uh, representative from the County Administrative Office, Melody Serrano, who's been with us for a long time and does a great job. I have my fiscal manager, Kathy Sams, and my law enforcement chief, Chris Clark, and my undersheriff, uh, Mitch Medina, is behind me, and our corrections chief, Dan Freitas, is here as well. And before I get started, I, I do want to uh, thank uh, the board and the CAO's office for the work on getting this budget prepared and in front of you. And I also want to acknowledge my staff. Uh, we, our, our correctional officers, our deputy sheriffs didn't have the luxury of working from home or working in an office. Uh, they're out on the front lines or they're in the jail uh, working hard with people who have a lot of different types of lifestyles. There was weeks uh, that went this year in early March where we had over 50 staff members a day off with COVID uh, positive tests. And so they, they've they been out there, they've been doing the work, they've been showing up every day and I just wanna acknowledge them. So let's go ahead and talk about the agenda real quick. So today we're going to just give you a, a, a brief online uh, review of our budget. We're going to talk a little bit about positions and some crime data and then go forward with a recommendation. Okay, you can see our, our mission statement and I won't read it, you guys can read it yourself. But in this day and age, we, uh, as a law enforcement profession, I think we really need to get back to the protect and serve motto that we used to see on all the patrol cars across the country. I think at the end of the day, that's really our job. And that's, uh, I believe in this mission statement, but I believe at the end of the day, we're, we're here to protect the community. We're here to protect the incarcerated population that we're in charge uh, of and take care of. And uh, we're here to serve the people of Santa Cruz County. You can see in this proposed budget, our total expenses have increased by about 5%. We're looking at roughly a $94 million budget this year. Uh, our revenues have gone up a little bit at about 33 million. 
uh, with a net county cost of about $60 million this year from the general fund. That's a 7% increase, which is largely salaries and benefits and then the addition of, of two non-sworn positions. And we don't take lightly that that number, a $60 million number. That's a big number, and, and I get it. That's general fund dollars. Uh, but at the end of the day, we need to run our jails. We need to have enough deputies out on the street and do all the things that are mandated from a sheriff's office, which uh, th there are a lot of different requirements that we have. And so uh, we're broken down into three divisions on this org chart. And you can see that the seven areas that we have under operations, or we call it our law enforcement group, investigations, community policing, coroner, civil, abandoned vehicles, and operations administration, which is basically all the administrators uh, in the office. And then on the correction side, the main jail and Blaine Street are lumped in together. And then we have our Roundtree facility, which is the Roundtree medium security jail, and then the Roundtree rehabilitation and reentry facility. Uh, if we can just click on the medical services, I, I do want to call this number out. Our medical services uh, costs and contract are increasing and they're tied to the San Francisco CPI, but they're also uh, having a hard time finding health professionals to work anywhere, whether it's a hospital or a jail. And so uh, the costs are going up in terms of trying to attract qualified people who are willing to work in, inside of a jail facility. And so this year we're anticipating spending about $7.7 .7 million on medical services in our correctional facilities. And then as you might recall, a couple of years ago, we transitioned to a contract for food services and that cost is a 1.6 million, which is substantially lower than before we did that. And so we are seeing a cost savings on this. Uh, our vendor Aramark is doing a fine job and providing quality food to our incarcerated population. So with that, let's go ahead and move on to uh, the next presentation, Melody. Uh, excuse me, can, can we talk about court security real quick? I do want to touch on court security because this is turning into a substantial general fund expenditure. Uh, by design, court security is supposed to be fully funded through the state. And it was back in 2011 when we signed our, our last contract. We've been out of contract with the state for many, many years now. And they're... they're Funding has not kept up with all the cost increases that we've experienced the last 10 years. And so uh, this year, our core security funding of 24 personnel plus transportation and some other things that we do is going to run about $5.3 million. And that's to provide judicial protection in the courts. It's also to move incarcerated population to uh, their court appearances and, and different types of visits that they have. And the general fund uh, hit now is about one and a half, 1.7 million, something like that. That's, that's how much underfunded this contract is with the state. And so we've, I've worked with the State Sheriff's Association. We've spoken with the governor's office uh, and our legislators to try to, to have the state catch up. I know Mr. Palacios has concerns about this as well. We've had a number of discussions about this, but this is an area that we really need to work on and get the state caught up to meet our our growing expenditures in this area. Yes, please. A number uh, or, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, can we move on to uh, just uh, one more slide? There we go. So uh, briefly, this is uh, our, our proposed staffing including the unfunded positions is 36 and a half. We're gonna be adding two positions uh, that are non-sworn for our, for our corrections bureau uh, for programming and visitation. You can see our expenses have gone up about four and a half million dollars uh, in the proposed uh, and uh, our revenues increased a little over a half million dollars. A couple of uh, board members have asked about how we're doing in terms of our unfunded and our funded positions. And you can see in this graph here in, in the fiscal year that we're concluding right now, we did have 32 and a half unfunded positions. Uh, we did receive some unanticipated growth money from our prison realignment AB 109 uh, fund that comes down from the state. We were able to refund a number of correctional officer positions. 
and then adding in the two non-sworn positions, if should your board approve this budget, we'll be at 23 and a half unfunded positions. And then just another way of looking at it, this is our funded positions. So we're gonna be at 344 this year. Three years ago, uh, or at an FY 1920, we were at 368. Uh, and when the pandemic hit, we had to unfund a number of deputy positions, correctional positions, and some professional staff positions. And uh, and you can see now that we're at about, really about a 10-year average at the 344 funded position mark. On our law enforcement side, uh, some major program or staffing changes is that we have increased our funding for uh, officer training in this proposed budget. We haven't done a lot of training outside of our mandated training during COVID. And so we're gonna be going back to our monthly trainings that we give uh, every deputy sheriff 10 hours of, of in-service training. And then this year we're putting 85 deputies through active shooter training in light of what's going on sadly around our country. And that's taking place this week and next week, along with many other local law enforcement officers. We've also restarted started our crisis intervention team training on, on teaching our deputies and reminding our deputies the best way to deal with people who are experiencing mental illness. And we've already held one session this year and we'll be holding another one in this calendar year as well. We did complete our DNA lab design. We brought in a consultant and used uh, some DNA trust money to pay the consultant to come up with a design and that has been completed. Our focused intervention team is up and running uh, with one deputy and one sergeant. We're gonna be adding the second deputy uh, back here in a few months when we get a couple of people off of training. And then your board might recall that we brought to your board a contract where uh, we have leased, the county uh, has leased a new sexual assault forensic examiner's office. It is a, it's a much better office. It's a, it, it provides survivors of sexual assault much more dignified care when they're going through an exam. Our safe team is conducting exams at that location now and it's going really well. And then some major emerging issues are gonna be the DNA lab construction. So we have the design now. Uh, we've hired, uh, our forensics team has an, a manager who has spent 20 years with the Department of Justice working on DNA cases. And so now we have to go into the construction phase of this. And I do have a, a substantial amount of money in several trusts uh, for the construction. And I'm gonna need to work with your board and the CAO's office in terms of how we're finding those remaining dollars are gonna be needed to build that lab. And I just wanna remind you of what the value of a DNA lab is. Can you imagine you're sitting, my staff sitting across the table from a sexual assault survivor and the case is gonna hinge on DNA evidence. And we have to tell that survivor, hey, listen, we can only send a small number of samples to the to, to the state lab, and it's going to be six to eighteen months before we get a return. That, that's a tough conversation to have with the survivor of a, uh, the family of a say a homicide victim or the survivor of a sexual assault. When we have our own DNA lab and we have that sample or that evidence, we can turn that evidence around in forty eight to seventy two hours, two to three days versus six months to eighteen months. One, to give some closure to the survivors of those crimes and also to get the perpetrator off the street so they don't violate or criminalize somebody else. I think it's hugely valuable. It's gonna be a game changer for law enforcement in this county and it's gonna serve this community well. Some other emerging issues that we're experiencing is our recruiting, hiring and retention. And we're doing pretty, good, pretty well on the law enforcement side, but the correction side, we're really having a hard time finding qualified applicants who can pass a background, who are willing to work in a correctional facility. And we're not unique. This is going on around the state. And so uh, we're at, right now we have 14 vacancies. I have 11 uh, correctional officers off on family leave or injury. So of the 100 correctional officer positions, I only have 75 filled right now. And then the last emerging issue I wanna just briefly discuss is the fentanyl crisis that we're seeing. Every night our deputies and our police officers are coming across people who 
have fentanyl in their possession, they've overdosed on fentanyl. Uh, our coroner's office is seeing a significant number of fentanyl overdose deaths. Every police officer and deputy sheriff in the county carries Narcan, and it's routine now for, for the police to do to be saving people with Narcan. It, it happens all the time. And so we're really gonna have to focus on uh, not just enforcement because we can't enforce our way out of a drug problem, but really just the education piece and the treatment piece of, of getting people the services they need to, to get them off this drug because this drug is, is killing a lot of people. All right, moving on to the Corrections Bureau. Uh, some of our uh, changes that we're gonna be seeing coming up is we're gonna be opening all jail facilities I may back up. We, we still have two facilities closed, but our the, the existing facilities we have open, we're gonna we're gonna open up uh, to uh, visitation, and the court is anticipating pulling the zero bail or uh, zero bail order that's in effect right now. So bail is going to be reinstituted into the local criminal justice system, which is going to cause our numbers to tick up. We're at about 360 people system wide right now, which is fairly low for us. Usually this time of year, say June of a non-pandemic year, we'd be at roughly 500, 480, 500, somewhere around there. But we're going to start seeing those numbers tick up. And I was really happy to see uh, Fernando Geraldo's report on the number of, of pre-trial releases that, the, that his team is, is working on because we rely on those guys to keep our numbers down. And what I'd like to see moving forward is is the courts, the DA, probation, public defender, and sheriff work on a pretrial plan. 65 to 70% of our population is pretrial. They have not been convicted of the crime that they're in custody for. We have one guy who's been pretrial since 2013, almost nine years now, going on 10 years, he's been pretrial. We have a large number of people pretrial, three years, four years, five years. And so we need the courts to take control of this and push these cases through so that the people can either be found not guilty and released or found guilty and move on to state prison. But our jail is not built to house people for this long a period of time. Well, we've just complete, completed our first year of our contract with WellPath on the mental health side and they're doing a fine job and that contract is going very well. Uh, Assembly Bill 1863 was passed, and that that has provided free electronic monitoring services to anybody who's on electronic monitoring, meaning that the county can no longer charge. So some uh, $500,000 was built into this budget to cover the charges that we used to refer back to the clients Then now that the county is responsible for. I uh, briefly touched on our staffing increases. And uh, going on to the major emerging issues, uh, we, we talked about recruiting, hiring, and retention on the operations side, and I touched on the correction side. Um, we're, your board uh, last year approved a, a large project that we're gonna replace all camera systems, alarms, uh, and control panel in the main jail. It's a, it's a very expensive project that's gonna take two years to complete. And then in terms of emerging issue, our jail, particularly the main jail, is an aging facility that we're going to need to come up with a plan on because just the design, the way it's built, and the maintenance on it is, is uh, it's in need of replacement. Uh, we've been working with Real Property on, on finding a modular uh, building to replace the recovery center out in front of the jail. And so we anticipate that modular uh, building being put in place in the spring and the recovery center restarting either late spring or early summer of 23. And then I've touched on the jail medical. And so uh, we talked to, or I heard the district attorney talk a little bit about crime rates. And this is something that we monitor or I monitor very closely as does my executive staff. And we report monthly to the FBI on a, a unif uniform crime report where all agencies have to report in on what the crime stats are for that month. And so this is a very accurate snapshot of where we are in the last 12 months. And so in Santa Cruz County, in the unincorporated area, not the city of Santa Cruz, Capitola, Watsonville, or Scotts Valley, but unincorporated Santa Cruz County, 
the number on the far left, the 9.87, is the number of crimes per 1,000 residents in, in unincorporated Santa Cruz County. And so the state average is, it's about two and a half times that. So we're, we're at about 40% of the state average for our overall crime rate. Our property crime rates, less than half of the state average. And then you can see our violent crime rate is very low, 1.6 compared to almost 4.4 on a state average. So crime-wise, we're doing pretty well. This is a graph showing since 2010 how our overall crime rate has, has been going and what direction. And you can see before prison realignment, we're at almost 27 crimes per 1,000 county residents. And now we're at about 11 crimes per 1,000 residents. So a reduction of about 60% in crime over the last 10 years. And then just touching on the homicide rate, fortunately, we have not had a homicide in un unincorporated Santa Cruz County this year. Uh, we had three last year. There was a slight uptick in 19 and 20. Uh, but we're, but I was getting concerned that we were going to start seeing this number elevate. You can see in the late 80s, uh, Santa Cruz County in the unincorporated area was uh, was a particularly violent time in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. And compared to that to uh, where we're at now, we're doing quite well in this area. And then just one last slide on this in terms of five-year increments, how we're doing. You can see in from 88 to 92, there was 32 murders in Santa Cruz County. And then in 2013 to 17, there was two. That's a, a very significant reduction. For the last five years, we've been at about the average that we've been for the last 30 years at 15. So some operational successes. Uh, our data transparency uh, was completed. I wanna thank Sven Safford for his work on that. Our staff is about 75% complete on our profiling and bias training. Our forensic lab, which will be running the DNA lab there, their accreditation is gonna be uh, completed in February of 2023. And then the practice range is still in concept right now. And I already touched on the DNA lab. Other successes, and I wanna call this out because in, in our world, this is very important in terms of our lateral and hi hiring incentive program. Your board authorized us to provide a $25,000 incentive to experienced police officers that were willing to transfer to the sheriff's office. And before this program started, it was rare when somebody came to the sheriff's office. Most people transfer over to Santa Clara Police Department, Sunnyvale, or some agencies over the hill where they can make up quite a bit more money. And so with that, with that hiring incentive, we've been able to hire and put to work 14 police officers in the last couple of years, and we're scheduled to hire three more this month. So it'll be 17 lateral hires in about two years. And so I know this program's working. I meet with everybody, each person that we hire, I meet with for an hour. And I ask the laterals, I say, hey, I ask them, does, does this incentive program, uh, did, did that help you come over here? And, and absolutely it does, not just the 25,000, but the way that it's structured. And it's structured that once they complete training, they, they receive that $25,000. Scotts Valley Police has a $40,000 hiring bonus, but they structure it over three years. So they get pieces of it over three years. And so the attractiveness is that one lump payment of 25,000, it might help them get a down payment or first last uh, on, on a rent or something like that. So it, it's been a very helpful program. We are allocated for three more, and I anticipate coming back to your board in the future to keep that program going. And the same goes with the Correctional Officer Hiring Incentive Program. We are getting people who are applying to us uh, because that $10,000 hiring bonus uh, is an incentive. Another success is uh, we've been able to reestablish a relationship with the Pajaro Valley Unified School District and reestablish our school resource officer program at Aptos High School. And we had a deputy on campus all year working in conjunction with a mental health uh, worker and that, that that team did very well. And the, the school and the district was very happy. I don't know if you guys saw the article in the paper, but there was a survey that was completed with students, faculty and parents and overwhelmingly there was support for that program at PVUSD. Uh, because of the pandemic, we stopped our volunteer program and now we are starting to reinstitute that program. So you'll see at your different service centers that you sometimes visit, you'll see some volunteers coming back and restaffing positions there. And then the last thing I wanna touch on 
is the armed prohibited person system grant with with gun violence being at the level that it is with some of these terribly remarkable school shootings that we're seeing. Uh, we, we've been trying to come up with ways that we can reduce the chances of gun violence in Santa Cruz County. We've done gun buybacks. Uh, we have a team that only works gun and drug cases, but uh, we were selected by the Department of Justice as one of three counties to receive funding to pay for a deputy to work on cases where the court has ordered somebody to give up their firearms, whether it was because of a, a gun violence restraining order, they were convicted of a felony or certain misdemeanors. Um, and there's several other reasons why, or if they have a mental illness and the court rules them to turn, it, turn in those firearms, oftentimes they don't. And so this deputy's job and the team that he works on is to go to these homes and make sure that those firearms are confiscated when the court tells the person they, uh, they can no longer possess firearms. And, and we've seized a lot of rifles and, and guns behind uh, that program. So that concludes my presentation and uh, I'm requesting that your board approve this proposed 22-23 budget for the Sheriff Coroner's office, including any supplemental material as recommended by the County Administrative Officer. And I'm happy to answer any questions, thank you. Thank you, Sheriff Coroner Hart. Are there questions or comments from members of the board? Supervisor McPherson. Yes. Um, you, thank you, Sheriff Hart and your team, your whole team, uh, for your work. That's been very difficult years with the CZU fire, um, the evacuations that, uh, and the aftermath of that and COVID. Um, you've really held steady as you can for your services to uh, Santa Cruz County. Uh, and this is uh, in addition to your ongoing work um, in investigations of patrol and other corrections and other roles, including the substations in uh, Felton and Boulder Creek, which are very much approved. And I'm telling you, you have a great representative and uh, Sergeant Jason Dunn and his team up there. They've done a fantastic job and the people of Santa Rosa Valley enjoy, appreciate it very much. Um, I, the, um, you've answered my uh, questions on staffing and capital improvements, but I want to re reiterate what I said at the first before I think you, you were in the room about um, the Chris, Criminal Justice Council that you conducted uh, in cooperation with the other four police agencies in this county um, for uh, a comparative review, a regional comparative review that's been recognized nationally as the first one of its type. Um, that, that's our Sheriff's Department, that's you and your personnel, and I just really appreciate Appreciate it, and please pass that on. How much uh, we appreciate your leadership in this, and congratulations on being reelected uh, without opposition. Well, thank you, and I, I I'm glad you brought that up because I, I felt like that was a really important report that the Criminal Justice Council put out, and and Supervisor Friend right. uh, was the leading voice on that, and he did a really uh, fine job of of wrangling all those chiefs and, and, and people from my office into the same room to get that work done. So thank you for acknowledging yeah. that. Sure. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Friend. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Sheriff Hart. First, I wanna acknowledge uh, your most recent promotion. I wanna acknowledge Chief Deputy uh, Freitas, outstanding promotion in your department. You've done a really good job developing internal talent um, is, as has under Sheriff Medina uh, with Chief Clark and Chief Freitas. I have a lot of confidence in the next generation, so to speak, of the Sheriff's Office continuing to do well. I want to reiterate a, a point that uh, that Supervisor McPherson made in regards to the San Lorenzo Valley, but, but make it in regards to my district, which is that the service centers in and of themselves are not a guaranteed thing. As you know, this was something that was brought by a previous sheriff that, that you had served under, but needed to be maintained by you in particular during some of the downturns and even through COVID. And they really do play a very important role for our neighborhoods. And, and uh, for us, uh, we've had a little bit of turnover there, but everybody that you've put within the office in Aptos has been uh, unbelievably responsive to my constituents and always available. And so uh, just a, a, a real deep appreciation for the the neighborhood service model that you've created. Uh, and I think that, that the degree that we can maintain those service centers moving forward is important. I'm glad to hear that the volunteers will be back because then we can probably get them back open a little bit more than they've been able to be to the public, which is also great. And to a point as well, on, I know we mentioned the, the Criminal Justice Council before, but your agency was one of the first to really take a deep dive into what the findings were and to proactively decide that there were going to be some upgrades made to what you're already doing. Now, 
With that said, your agency was also way ahead of number of other agencies within the county for some of the policies and procedures that you and your team had implemented about five years ago, well in advance of that with the 21st century policing. But we're not done yet, and I and I appreciate the work in particular of uh, Under Sheriff Medina in regards to what we're working on this year with behavioral health, which is one of the real uh, underpinning issues with uh, its relationship with frontline law enforcement and really the data collection around what that looks like within our county. Um, I, I don't think that, I think people take for granted uh, how progressive and forward thinking our local law enforcement community is. It, it just doesn't look like this across the country in the same way, this level of collaboration, this level of forward thinking, uh, and the fact, quite frankly, that, that you ran unopposed and, and as did the district attorney, I think is a very strong statement about what the community feels in support of its local law enforcement community. And you should take a lot of pleasure in that and also recognize that you are serving this community very well and creating a culture very well. Lastly, I'll just end on this. Uh, your agency has been through a lot of trial and tribulation, not just with COVID, but obviously with the loss of, of a remarkable person. And I just want to appreciate uh, your advocacy and support and family support over us working on the Willowbrook Park project in, in Damon's honor. Uh, it's really a, an unbelievable testament to the entire community coming forward and your line level deputies. I mean, your line level staff contributing $100,000 out of their own paychecks in order to help convert this park in his honor. Uh, it, it's just a beautiful thing to turn tragedy into hope. And I appreciate your, uh, your, your entire partnership and support on that. Thank you, Sheriff Hart. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Supervisor Kennedy. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sheriff Hart. Two quick questions. Uh, one is I really appreciate the uh, full staffing of the FIT team, and I, I could see the see their vehicles moving around town, and I know uh, we're all grateful for it. Um, is the secondary component, which is the jail beds, uh, available? And um, what's the timeline? If not, what's the timeline looking for that? Yeah, the, the beds are available and we are we are using them now. We're we're using them a little bit differently in that we're not dedicating a, a, a unit. They're the, the the fit clients are being spread out throughout the facility as as they're getting classified, which uh according to our fit team right now is the model that they they want to use rather than putting them all together. They think they might be more effective this way. Oh. Thank you, that's the best news I've heard uh, in this budget hearing, uh, and I really appreciate it. The uh, second question is, um, we are coming up on July 4th, and uh, I know our beaches from the North Coast all the way South are always impacted, and I imagine with high gas prices, we tend to be a destination uh, for in the region for folks to, who are looking to get away uh, from the heat and have a good time. Um, how, are, how are preparations coming for the July 4th uh, and frankly, the rest of the summer uh, in terms of um, basic public safety in our, on our beaches and coastlines? So I'll, uh, I'll start with the summer uh, wide question. We have three deputies who are dedicated full-time to beach patrol in addition to the deputies that are working their, their regular beats. And uh, they are, present at a lot of the high volume, high use uh, type beaches, and they're doing a good job out there right now. And then in terms of the 4th of July, we're gonna have a lot of deputies out all weekend long, starting on Friday night, all the way through Monday uh, night. And uh, we're, we're, we're gonna start our messaging uh, here in the next day or two in terms of fireworks, alcohol, uh, and, and all the issues that go along with that. So. I, I agree with you. I think it's got potential to be sort of a, a weekend long uh, challenge for residents and law enforcement, um, but we are well staffed for the weekend. All right, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Supervisor Cabot. Uh, thanks for the report. Uh, I, uh, you know, every job has uh, risk and uh, responsibility. But uh, I, I can't think of one where you're uh, damned if you don't and damned if you do, uh, like being a deputy sheriff or working in the sheriff's department. Uh, you're, the level of expectation is set so high. Uh, you you can have a career of you know, five, six years, everything goes real well. But if you make one mistake, uh, that the public focus uh, is incredible. That's uh, really tough. It's uh, you got a tough job. 
and uh, uh, I respect you for doing it, <laughs> but uh, vo there's voluntary overtime and then there's involuntary overtime. Uh, how how bad is that with your department right now? Uh, voluntary overtime I can understand sometimes, but involuntary is basically you don't have anybody to take an extra shift. You just tell somebody you got to do it. And uh, that's where you get into trouble. You're tired, you're irritated, you're hungry, and uh, you got to do another shift. So on the law enforcement side, we're we're doing okay where we don't have, we call it mandatory overtime. On the correction side, with only having about 75 working correctional officers, we are doing a lot of mandatory overtime. And uh, some of these folks are working their regular four day a week, 12 hour day job, and then they're having to pick up one, sometimes two shifts a week in addition to that, depending on their team and 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 who's off. Uh, we only allow one person off on vacation at a time, but there's also been a lot of sickness. So people are coming down with COVID or something else and they're not able to come into work. So uh, to answer your question, it it is a burden on the correction side and our staff is overworked. And we really, as managers, try to keep an eye out on how they're doing and checking in with them. And and if they need, need a day off, we try to get them a day off. Uh, we're hiring as fast as we can, but there's just not that many people willing to do this work. So we're doing the best we can with that. But I, I truly believe our correction staff is is uh, working a lot of hours, but um, they're hanging in there. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, <laughs> I did see in there uh, the word it was in fentanyl or something like that. I'm, I, I have no knowledge of that at all is uh, I'm assuming it's a drug though. It is. It's a synthetic opiate and it's a, it's a lot stronger than heroin and people are thinking they're taking maybe a stimulant like cocaine, but it might have some fentanyl in it, which is a depressant. And so they, they are overdosing on it and uh, people are taking pills that are made in another country or somewhere else that aren't pharmaceutical grade that have fentanyl in it. And uh, then some people are just taking straight fentanyl. Uh, because of the high or the low or whatever it is they're trying to get. And uh, it's very powerful and it's, it's, it's knocking them down. It's uh, oh. and killing people. Okay. Uh, what, uh, what age range uh, is it? Where is it most prevalent? It's not, it, it's not a college drug, is it? It's uh, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting and heroin is the same way, but there's really no demographic. We see uh, all, uh, all ages, as young as 16, as old as 75. It uh, doesn't matter how much money you make, where you live. If 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 you get caught up in that, it it's pretty uh, indiscriminate. It's gonna it's gonna it's gonna get you eventually if you're using that drug. Yeah. Well, anyway, thank you for uh, all your service and uh, uh, good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Cabot. Well, uh, Sheriff, I'm glad to hear that you've we've got 85 people in active shooter training. I mean, as you said, in response to some of the worrying trends we're seeing uh, countrywide, um, you know, there's there's a lot of critique in, around the country for school resource officers, but it does seem like uh, you know, the, with the approval rating, particularly from the um, you know Aptos Pajaro uh, Unified School District, that um, you know we're doing something right. Is there is there a significant difference in the way that we carry out the school resource officer program with maybe the way um, others around the country do? Well, I, I've heard a lot of the advocates talk about this school to prison pipeline, and it doesn't exist in Santa Cruz County. Uh, we did it. We, we, we look back on some data. And so for the three years preceding COVID, when schools were fully functioning and all the kids were attending, between the three high schools we service, Aptos, Soquel, and San Lorenzo Valley, uh, there was a total of two physical arrests in three years. And the only reason why we arrested those kids is a parents refused to come pick them up. And so we had to take them to the hall and then eventually their parents came and picked them up. But we try to work with the school uh, on solving problems without getting justice system involved. We don't get involved in school rules and violations. That's up to the school to handle those. And we encourage our school resource officers to establish relationships with the students and the faculty 
so that people are comfortable around them. And I, I, I think it's a good program. I've always been an advocate for it. And uh, I, I think now that, that people are, are seeing the, the value in it in PVUSD, I, I, I think they appreciate the program as well. Yeah, it's, it sounds like it. So it's, I mean, that's fantastic to hear that um, the offices are able to serve as a, as a resource, an informational resource, uh, um, and uh, that we've only really relied on the arrests very seldomly. That's right. I mean, of course, it's also fantastic that um, we're able to put the school resource officers uh, to use through the summer, um, patrolling the beaches. I know that's been very much appreciated uh, by constituents in the first district as uh, the Live Oak beaches, as was mentioned, can get a bit rowdy in the summer. <laughs> Um, how certain are we that the courts are going to change the zero bail policy? And is that like July 1st or what's the contemplated date for uh, that? Last I heard it was July 1st and yeah, uh, Chief Freitas is nodding his head. So yeah, it's uh, effective July 1. Okay, well, that's that's good to hear. I know we've also heard a lot of concern about, um, you know, the revolving door uh, at the jail lately. And I know that uh, you've had your hands tied in, in many ways. So it'll be good to, uh, in some ways, get back to normal. Um, and, and as the city moves forward to move up the San Lorenzo camp down here, are you going to be assisting them in, in that operation at all? Yeah, we, we, I, I've offered some resources to the city police and Chief Escalante and I have talked on the phone. We're going to meet in the next week or two and, and really figure out what it is they need. And, and if there's any way we can help, we will definitely provide the services. That's great. Um, and then, I mean, it's, it's also nice to hear the, the success of the lateral programs and uh, hiring deputies. Um, that's, that's very encouraging. Is there, is there anything we can do to, on the correctional officer front? Um, is, as you said over and over again, just it's really demanding work. Uh, yeah, it, it is. It's, it's hard work. And th those, the folks that work there are locked in the facility for 12 hours a day, just like the incarcerated population. And uh, with COVID, it's, it's uh, wearing an N95 12 hours a day is also very challenging. Um, but we're, we're working internally and we're always talking to the personnel department about what else it is we can do to attract people. And at the end of the day, I think money talks. And that's, that's what this generation is, is uh, looking for. And we're, we're unfortunately right next door to a massive economic engine that can afford to pay uh, people more than we can here in Santa Cruz County. And so what, we, what, what I find to be the most successful re, uh, recruit is somebody who's grown up here, who's from this area, they have established family, they might even have established housing and they want to stay here and serve the community where they grew up. And that's, that's the group that we're really targeting. Okay. Is it challenging, but hopefully, yeah, we can find more hometown uh, recruits. Um, yeah. And I'll just end by, you know, also praising the community policing program. Um, if folks feel very well uh, resourced with Sergeant Hop and um, Lieutenant Baltridge. So thanks very much for that. Great. They do a fine job. Thank you. Yeah. All right, any, uh, not take public comment, anyone wishes to address us on the sheriff's budget, please uh, approach the podium. Thank you. My name is Becky Steinberger. I live in the rural area of Aptos and this is a tough time for law enforcement at a time when our nation has been screaming defund police. <laughs> You've really gotten a little respect for the important work you do. And I think we've seen the effects of that. So I wanna thank you and, and everyone that serves in the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department for the good work you do. Um, I have some questions. <laughs> um, whatever happened with the uh, North Coast radio tower that was supposed to improve emergency communication up on the North Coast? I heard it was canceled. I'm very interested in uh, effective communication up on the North Coast, especially. And I wonder if that tower did get canceled or if it is just put on hold. I have, um, I'm happy to hear the volunteers are coming back. Uh, the Mid County Safety Center has essentially been closed to the public, even though it's been supported financially by the taxpayers. So I'm glad to hear that that will be reopening. There's a huge um, problem with mail theft in our county. 
huge problem. And um, I don't know what your office can do. The post office seems rather unconcerned because it is so rampant, but I would be interested in working together with your office to try to figure out something to do in the rural county areas for mail theft. I am um, really happy about, uh, I didn't hear anything about it, but the abandoned vehicle abatement program, I, I fully support and hope that that can remain funded and removing these vehicles that often get left out in the rural area and sometimes even get set on fire, which is really scary. So um, I'm, I'm supportive of that program continuing. Um, I am still, worried about the number of jail suicides that I have heard about, especially um, Mr. Kohut, <laughs> which really should have, been, should have been prosecuted, but he's not, um, he's gone. Finally, my question is how much Prop 172 money are, is you? Good afternoon. Now, I'm James Healing Whitman. It was, I'm glad I stuck around to listen to this. Um, I really appreciated the definition of the dangers of fentanyl. Boy, it's never been worse to just don't do it. Um, what's happened in our society where up through the 70s, and I even believe when I went to high school in Palo Alto in the 80s, people brought rifles to school. And it, it wasn't an issue. What has changed in our society? There are so many things going on. Um, I appreciate this. There was a lot of information. I shared two, I wrote two pages. Um, and it just seems like let's just keep working with law enforcement. I mean, my personal experience, and I was thinking about this for several minutes, probably 199 out of 200 times I've engaged with law enforcement, it's actually been positive. I honestly couldn't think of something that was bad, even if they were we were almost yelling at each other. So um, I think law enforcement has a really difficult job. I know after the recent shooting in Texas, so this time I'm going to look at my notes. Previous police chief Andy Mills put out an article, you know, within a week of that, and he had some really interesting observations to say about law enforcement. And um, I wish I knew the date; I could say it, but. Um, Law enforcement has a very challenging job, and for the most part, they're doing great. I don't always witness that with other people, but mostly with myself, and I stand up when I need to, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. Anyone else here in the chambers? Is there anyone on Zoom? We have no speakers on Zoom, Chair. All right, then I'll return it to the Board for Action. Mr. Chair, I'll move the recommended actions. All right, motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor McPherson to approve the 22-23 Sheriff Coroner budget. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. This item passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much to the entire Sheriff Coroner team. That is the last item on our regular agenda today. We will now uh, recess budget hearings until Tuesday, June 28th at 1 p.m. And we'll do a final review of the 22-23 budget. Thank you.